call the meeting to order at uh, at 6:30 p.m. The mayor is uh, is out sick tonight, so I will be uh, <coughs> chairing the meeting. The first item on the agenda is identification of remote participants. The uh, statute provides that if there are members of the public body who are participating remotely, that they are required to be identified at the beginning of the meeting. And so we've added that to our form uh, agenda. We don't have anyone in that position uh, <clears throat> at this point. Uh, next item is to approve the agenda. The agenda is uh, has been circulated. Are there any uh, requested changes to the agenda? The minutes have been posted, and there's a lot of them because there were the two extra meetings, the little ones, mm -hmm. and the one that got punted back for a technical error. So with the minutes that are available that are finalized on the web that you all saw are for the 31st, the 28th, the 23rd, the 9th, and the other 23rd. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's four weeks in February, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's how that works. And uh, oh, also the liquor licenses um, that you all got as well. They should be approved. It's kind of last minute for them. OK, so if there are no objections to that, we'll uh, add those to the consent agenda. Anyone else on the uh, on the council want to make any changes to the uh, to the agenda? Reviewing the agenda, um, I was I'm going to suggest moving item 11, the Elks Club process, up uh, a little bit higher on the ad agenda to just after item 7, the regional dispatch update. Um, we've got a lot of items on the agenda. We will do what we can to uh, to get through everything. Well, I mentioned both the uh, item number and the subject, and what the proposal is. This is the agenda that is on the table. I see it, uh, 16 on column one is the no club process. That's what you're that's what I'm referring to as a posted agenda is 11. I don't know. Um, uh, okay, good. And then uh, the, the substance of all of them is, uh, is the same. I don't know how that would have happened. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weiss. Um, Next, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for uh, a member of the public to uh, address the council on uh, any matter that is not otherwise on the agenda. Um, and I'm going to recognize myself briefly at the beginning. We had a public meeting in this in this room just last week and a member of the public subjected uh, one of the city employees to an offensive offensive sexist uh, epithet and uh, i would think that we should all be aware that that is the kind of behavior that is completely unacceptable and intolerable and further is destructive of the productive uh, discussion that we hope to have in all of the public bodies of Montpelier. And I hope that we will not see that kind of conduct uh, repeated. Do you want to be recognized now? On that same topic with more specificity. At the Homelessness Task Force meeting last week, uh, Thursday, April 7th, Mr. Stephen Whitaker called a city staff member a bitch and a mad cow to their face in the presence of and audible to others. Mr. Whitaker also attempted to touch and operate city technology equipment despite prior warnings, both verbally and in writing, to refrain from such behavior. 
People may certainly participate in public meetings and offer criticism of the decisions and actions of city public officials. Resorting to personal attacks, attacks such as these cross the line of acceptability. Public meetings are, by their nature, open to the public to attend. Participation is allowed, but is not unlimited. 1 VSA 312H states, the public shall be given a reasonable opportunity to express its opinion on matters considered by the public body during the meeting as long as order is maintained. Public comment shall be subject to reasonable rules established by the chairperson. I do not take such language directed at city staff lightly, nor should the city council. Mr. Whitaker's behavior in this instance, in my opinion, is vulgar and childish. The city staff and I welcome robust public discourse on all issues. We understand that disagreement and criticism are part of that process. However, no person, whether elected official, public employee, volunteer, or resident should be subject to personal and disrespectful attacks of this nature. I will be preparing a recommended set of reasonable rules for ma to, to maintain order at meetings consistent with the open meeting law for the council's consideration in the near future. Individuals who do not comply may be escorted from the meeting. Uh, Ken Russell, I saw you were up first. I was unaware that you two are going to make those statements, um, but I fully support them, and that's exactly why I'm here in this chamber. I witnessed um, these horrible sexist attacks on a hard working uh, public servant. Um, we have disagreements, um, but we need to treat each other with respect. Um, the other thing I want to mention is there was a horrible murder of Fern Feather up in Morrisville. Fern spent a lot of time in Montpelier, hung around Langdon Street Cafe, was a beautiful person and was murdered in a terrible way, which in a way that appeared to be a hate crime. So how we treat each other matters, how we talk about these topics matter. Um, <coughs> We had a beautiful homelessness task force meeting today where people were thoughtful and sensitive and listening to each other and problem solving in a, in a meaningful way. Sometimes the, the uh, fire and brimstone that gets thrown in this chamber is disgusting. Thank you. Thank you. So to correct the record, this is Stephen Whitaker. Uh, I, ref I said she's being a bitch. The meeting hadn't started. I was not, there's no issue of conduct or interrupting the meeting. I said she was being a bitch. I was setting up a tripod to record the meeting and moved this to right there. And this is moved often by every speaker who needs it, moved up, moved down, whatever. But she chose to attack me on that because of this issue of touching city equipment. And that's just, there's this petty thing going on about job performance and, uh, and I'll call her on it. And I did not interrupt the meeting. I did not call her a mad cow. Uh, you know, so, you know, you gotta get your facts straight before you go reading things into the record. So, cause there's probably, actually I have a recording of that cause my machine was on probably. So, uh, you wanted me to continue with my public comment now? Yeah. The uh, city, the last two snowstorms, the public works department, I, I suspect they're on spring break or something, but they never, five days after both of the last two snowstorms, they didn't plow the snow out of the parking spaces on most of the free parking areas in town. That's, that's ripping us off for both the inconvenience of the parking ban and the, the budget of the public works. Secondly, now here we are weeks, a month after the snow, the cones uh, and the yellow tape and the sticks that were per blocking off sidewalks for uh, ice falling, they're still scattered around town. They're on Langdon Street, they're on State Street. It's like, who's watching? There's, there's inches of sand and mud in all the corners. And on the dry days, it's blowing. There's clouds of toxic dust blowing in town. It's like we're paying for public works and they're not doing their job. You know, a wheelbarrow and a shovel, you know, it's a broom. If you want to employ some of the folks at the park, you know, do that. But don't, you know, stay in your cozy homes and pretend like the city is being properly managed. 
Uh, secondly, body cams. Uh, you you may recall, you were assured at the last time I brought it up about the selection of the type of body cam and a purpose-built body cam. And you were reassured that, oh, there'll be time to discuss that. True to form, Bill Frazier stuck it on the consent agenda. A pre-made decision, a sloppy procurement process. Axon, who provided loaners and the city lost or concealed the proposal that they, if, if y'all were doing your due diligence, you would have an attorney call Axon and get a copy of the proposal that they delivered to Montpelier, which included body cams and tasers, and this and proved that the city lied about not having that proposal. And secondly, they didn't even bid, or their bid wasn't even considered. But there's no discussion in the bid comparison. The reason I'm going into this is because it's on your consent agenda, but you would be wise to remove it from the consent agenda and, and discuss it. But a, a smartphone, is not going to get turned on properly or assuredly and we're going to miss important video coverage of our police behavior and or suspects behavior uh i guarantee it and to whatever the cost savings is is not well documented but the smartphone app barry city voted to move forward on axon body cameras purpose built you touch them and they record 30 seconds prior to when you touch them and although the audio is not present for the 30 second pre-roll, but we can't afford to not have body cams that work. Uh, Berlin has Axon body cams. Motorola makes a good one too, but they rejected it in favor of a cheap smartphone model. Y'all need to intervene. You need to take over or have an independent body do that procurement process. You can't leave it to the police. There is no technology plan. Yeah, I know you're tired of hearing me. Okay, yes, Tom. Hi, uh, Thomas Moore, Prospect Street. I attended that uh, homeless committee thing. Um, <clears throat> the incident there was uh, on both sides. It just seemed like almost like a feeding frenzy. One would be smart to one, the other would be rude to the other, nasty. And at one time it, it just kept going on and I was, just like I'm leaving here. What? What? You know, this is this is just terrible. But um, as a you know a city employee should be a little bit more professional and just let it go and not stir it up either. I know certain individual is a little difficult here, but it was like you know they were going at it. You know, you know always you know wanting to get the last word in. So it wasn't just one person at it. Um, you know, in my business, if I get a nasty person, just sort of listen to them and somewhat diffuse it a little bit and go on with my job. But it was a two way thing. It wasn't just a one. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mary Messier, Montpelier. Uh, I was at the meeting. I missed the first part. I was here for the last part. Uh, I didn't hear all the words. I am hard of hearing. I could sense that it was aggressive feeling. And sometimes if people really find it some, maybe some mixture of things, it's the end of the meeting, it had ended, they could take it outside. There are people that come here are citizens and some of the people that come here have been through traumatic situations and aggressiveness in a meeting can be triggering. Um, I will say um, it's it's really unfortunate. People have, you know, really good ideas or suggestions. And whichever side, if somebody gets really aggressive and decides to name call or something, it, it ruins that. So that's really unfortunate. And it was horrible. And I've seen it again uh, before here too. Sorry to say, same person. I would rarely ever get up and talk about this kind of thing. But I like the city council. I'm just getting involved. And I'd like what I'd like to see is it be civil. If it's really that tense for you with someone, call them up, discuss it later, or something. That particular person, Steve, uh, I was interested in joining the task force, and. Um, he asked me in the hallway one day to 
assist someone out on the street. And at that time, I didn't feel I could. And while talking about the task force, he said, you don't deserve to be on the task force. You know, that's uh, shredding people. It's not necessary. So I agree with the council that we really need, you know, people can disagree. I don't know what was said here. I didn't hear it. But if you're really feeling that much tension and that much disagreement, save it till later, have a mediation. You know, there's lots of avenues. Um, we all make mistakes. You know, it all happens sometimes to all of us. So let's just be mindful. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the room who would like to be uh, recognized? Because I see there are a couple of people uh, on Zoom. Um, Vicki Lane, looks like you're first. Um, yes. Um, thank you, Bill and Jack uh, and Ken, for your words. Um, I did watch that entire uh, conversation or interaction, and it was clear what he did. Um, it was abhorrent behavior. Uh, when he got up just a few minutes ago, I expected him to apologize instead of um, try to talk himself out of what he did. Um, that kind of behavior is is totally unacceptable, uh, should not be tolerated. And I hope we don't get to the point of where we have to have a police officer sit in the in the council chambers because a member of the public cannot behave themselves in a in a civil manner. Um, I did not see and I have rarely seen Mr. Whitaker be civil in the council chambers. Um, and I think it's it's that was absolutely the most disgusting display I have seen. Um, and and he did exactly what people said he did. I don't care how he chooses to remember it, but it's it was pretty clear to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Morgan Brown. Yeah, I <clears throat> Morgan Brown. District 3 resident Mapia. On this current discussion, um, just speaking in general, I didn't witness uh, the incident being described. Uh, this time I was remote and I don't think I caught that. But, um, and, you know, I have witnessed uh, previous exchanges, uh, including between the two persons uh, in question. And there has been a back and forth over the years, <laughs> actually. Um, that said, in very general terms, besides what I understand uh, somebody had proposed uh, doing when a person's disruptive, if it rises to that level, it's besides escorting heaven the police escort somebody out if they won't leave, if they've asked to leave. I think there should be other consequences to those actions. And, um, you know, there are laws on the books, including, you know, uh, violations of, you know, if a person's um, being disruptive and disturbing the peace. And I think it applies, you know, at meetings, including you know, the meeting the other day in council chambers. And there should be a procedure or policy for um, staff members or a chair of a, a, you know, task force or whatever to be able to, uh, you know, say, contact somebody and say, hey, uh, we need assistance here. And well, and first ask the person to stop. And then if they don't ask them to leave, and, you know, there should be a protocol, there should be a policy. And if need be, call somebody, if need be, call the police and um, have the person escorted out. But if it raises to a certain level, the person needs to be uh, dealt with, uh, you know, and, you know, charged if need be. 
And I'm not talking about Stephen here. I'm talking about anybody, even a staff member. Even okay, a thank you. Thanks, Thanks Morgan. Oh, thank you. By the, by the way, when you were on the uh, discussing uh, the approved agenda, I had been hoping to get uh, um, recognized, but I couldn't. And and I had a concern about the, uh, when you get to the consent agenda, I was hoping that C, the body warm cameras, could be uh, removed and put on a regular regular agenda. I had emailed very late but, uh, about it, but you know, I would hope that the council do that. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up in the room or uh, on Zoom. The next item of uh, business is the consent agenda. Is uh, are members of the council satisfied with the council with the consent agenda as is? Is there anyone who wants to have anything removed from the consent agenda? Yeah, Lauren. Can I just make a comment about the body worn cameras? I I don't think it needs to be removed, um, but so I think that. You know, the police review committee had seen the previous proposal just to let people know and no concerns had been raised about this particular vendor and just approving the vendor today does not preclude ongoing conversation around the, the policies the city can use around the technology and um, and so I think. To me, moving forward with the, the contract and the vendor today makes sense, and I think we can you know, very much have an ongoing conversation on how we're using them as a community. So just want to make clear that this doesn't stop that conversation, which I think is important. Okay, thank you. Would you like a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? That would be timely. <laughs> That's what I just did. That's your motion. <laughs> and it's been moved, the consent agenda has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, any discussion, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We've adopted the consent agenda. I, I would like to make one comment also about the body cameras. We had a presentation. We've had a couple from the department, and then we had some from the vendor. So it has been part of city council meeting and discussions previously. I just thought I put that in there. Good point. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, item... 2022-106 appointment to the historic preservation committee and we have one vacancy and one um, applicant and i'm trying to see ward joyce ward, ward are you here why don't you step up and uh, just introduce yourself This? Yes, please. Okay. Good evening, Ward Joyce. I'm a local architect. I've been here for 22 years practicing. I have um, designed and renovated 20 houses in town, and I have a keen awareness of the preservation guidelines, and I'm happy to participate in the commission, especially since they are lacking a quorum. So Meredith twisted my arm, <laughs> and I said I'd be very happy to sit on the com commission until they could get through um, spring business, which is critical flow for them. So I offered to join the commission. So have they been just handcuffed, unable to do anything because of not? I think they recently lost someone. Okay. And yeah. It, does anyone on the council have any questions? I wish I planned ahead to grill you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm really, really pleased that you stepped forward. And Thanks. Connor. Yeah, I'll move to appoint Ward Joyce to the Historic Preservation Commission. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations and thank you, Mr. Joyce. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the uh, regional dispatch update. Um, so we have a cast of thousands to present and I. Uh, uh, Expect it might take a minute or two to get you may have to bring your own get the video set up. <laughs> well, while the uh, 
While the staff is getting set up, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this week is national. I don't know. I know my mic's not on. <laughs> Thank you. Well, while we're uh, while they're getting set up, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that this week is National Public uh, Safety Communicators Week, and acknowledge the great work that uh, all of our dispatchers and and uh, communications professionals do, and those of Barry and and all over the state. I see our dispatch supervisor, Carrie McCool, is here. So to Carrie, on behalf of me and our staff, to all of you, thank you for the great work that you do all the time. Can we do three cheers, hurrah? <laughs> <laughs> Also, also, while we're setting up, we'll do some introductions um, before we get to the two chiefs. In the back of the room, we have uh, Deputy Police Chief uh, Larry Eastman from Barry City. Larry, you want to? And Police Chief Brad Vale, I believe I saw come in. Chief, there you are. City Manager Steve McKenzie is here with us. Deputy Fire Chief Joe Allsworth is here. Of course, our, our own Deputy Chief Eric Nordenson is with us, and uh, Dispatch Supervisor Kerry McCool, and uh, this is Fire Chief Doug Brent, and of course, Police Chief Brian Pete from uh, Montpelier. All right, introduction. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, council members, uh, City Manager, Assistant City Manager, members of the public, my name is Brian Pete. I'm the Police Chief for Montpelier. Uh, as you gotta be next to that mic. Oops. Here, tell you what, I'm gonna stand up. I've been sitting there that whole time. My name is Brian Pete. I am the chief of police for Montpelier, and as the city manager had pointed out with me, are uh, leaders from both Barry and Montpelier, and together we have been working on the communications infrastructure issues that we've been dealing with. This is something that several people before us, uh, several folks who are still within the group, uh, to including our own council member, have been working on trying to bring uh, just improved communications infrastructure to um, the central area, to the Twin Cities area. So with this, uh, Chief Brent is gonna go ahead and lead. He drew the large straw push to the front um he's just a better speaker than all the rest of us you can tell by my mumbling right now so i'm going to move the slides and he's going to go ahead and talk the magic thank you chief can you hear that okay there we go sorry about that <laughs> sorry about that so as chief pete's indicated um we've had a great working relationship with the city of montpelier and the city of barry um when Chief Fakos was still at the police department, he and I got together to bring our two cities together and all the public safety officials from each of the two cities, from the fire and EMS department and the police department. We also included the city managers in these um, group meetings, and we operationally have gotten a lot of things done between the two cities, and we work much closer than we ever have before. And in those discussions, um, as they proceeded, one of the things that became very clear was that there were communications issues. This was just prior to um, CVPSA taking on the uh, task of hiring a consultant to do a communication study here in Central Vermont, and they hired Televate, which you folks may have heard of the Televate study. Uh, it's a whole lot to digest. It's 111 pages, um, and um, I'm sure it would be like reading Sanskrit if you hadn't read it before. It's really, really um, confusing to lay people as well as to uh, us who are very, very versed in this. So I'm fortunate that, as Chief Pete said, I, I thought I drew the short straw, but he said I drew the long straw. Um, we're very fortunate we have great dispatch centers here in, in, in central Vermont. And one of the things that we have come up against often is why do we need two? One of the um, pieces of information that's come out relative to our operation jointly between us is that we have a fiber line that connects both of the dispatch centers, both Barry and Montpelier. 
And because of that, we share the ability to take over for each other if there should be a problem. Uh, I come, came from a previous department that had somebody walk into the police office, dispatch office one night, uh, a member of the public, they were cleaning out the uncle's attic and found a grenade and brought it into the police department. It was a live grenade. Thusly, the whole um, police station had to be evacuated as well as dispatch. Um, so for us, um, we work so closely with Montpelier Dispatch uh, that if that were to happen to either one of us, we have the ability and the capability to take over for each other. And um, that is really important because one of the things that we're talking about, and I know that your council has addressed this in previous years and um, may have even funded it this coming this year, uh, is replacement of the consoles at the dispatch center. We also need them in Barry, so we've joined joined together on this, and we're going out jointly to get these consoles together, so that we get the same brand, the same type, uh, so our dispatchers are used to the same same equipment. Right out right out of the gate, one of the things that we can enjoy out of that is buying in bulk rather than each going our separate separate ways. Um, we also are able to get in on state bid for some of this equipment as well as well as the state technology support system that's there for this. The consoles that we're kind of targeting or, or honing in on are the same ones that are used statewide by the state police. They have 40 of these units in place. We're very confident between all of us on our communications team here with the Twin Cities that um, those have been well vetted by the state police and their staff know how to take care of them. We've been promised that we would have availability to spare parts should they be needed uh, on weekends, nights. Uh, so um, we, we feel very good about that. And um, so we put together a small slideshow and I'm pretty sure that maybe Mr. Frazier sent this out to the council or, or no, this is their first time seeing it. Okay, we've seen it, yeah. So Capital Region's communication system. Obviously, it's been called lots of things over the years. One of the things that we most recently have had the opportunity to take place in as, as at their invitation, a little background, the state police have dispatched for a lot of communities over the years. Currently, they're dispatching for 110 agencies that are not the state police. They're small town police departments, they're small town fire departments, EMS providers from, out, out, from out, all kinds of places, all, all corners of the state and they have become totally saturated with numbers of calls and the ability to do this um, and they are actually doing it for free for a majority of these communities and they just have the state has stood up and said there is a cost to this you all know that here in montpelier because you have dispatch customers we know that in barry because we have some dispatch customers not as many as you do um, but um, there is a cost to dispatching. We know we do budgets every year, so we're very familiar with the, the ongoing costs that we all uh, all face from now and now and again. So these 110 agencies that are going to be shed by the Department of Public Safety are going to be looking for other places to have dispatching done for them. And um, what we have tried to do here with our Twin Cities group is to position ourselves to be equipment wise and readiness wise to accept some of those customers that may come forward and need dispatching services. It would be at a cost, no different than our customers pay currently. Um, so we would use the same methods that we use for the current people that we uh, contract with and, and assist these other folks. In doing that, in saying that, the state of Vermont has said, well, if you're willing to step up to the plate and do some of this, we'll make some money available for infra infrastructure improvements. One of the things that our Twin Cities group had, had looked at, and one of the things that the Televate report had verified is that there are some severe communications issue on the fire side of things uh, in the central Vermont area. We have some extremely old equipment that's, that's really at end of life. I kind of liken it to the fact of saying to you all that if you're using a Commodore 64 or a Tandy Radio Shack 80 computer now, you're probably using the same vintage equipment that we're 
protecting the city of Montpelier and the city of Barrie and all the surrounding communities using. So this is one of the reasons that we want to move forward with this. So we had kind of identified the problem. CVPSA had kind of verified what that problem was. And the state came asking because they knew we were looking for money um, to say, if you'll be our partner and step forward and possibly take on some of these customers that we're shedding, we'll help you in making the dispatch and communications infrastructure upgrades that you need to. And um, so we have tried to ready ourselves for that. We've used the figures that were put together through in the Televate study and to get our foot in the door. And we feel really good about it. It's, the, as I said, the capital region. Um, these are the different departments that are dispatched for by either Barry or Montpelier. And as you can see, there's quite a few of them. Go ahead, Brian. Um, it's important to note in that last slide, one of the things that we checked out during our catchment area investigation is we're protecting with our dispatch centers, the two of them, about 75,000 people. And we're protecting about 750 square miles for our dispatch centers, the two dispatch centers between the two of them. So um, what's, been what's been done? So the background for the capital region. One of the things that the legislature was calling it was the Washington County dispatch. And we didn't like the sound of that because it's more than just Washington County. It's into Orange County. And um, we want to make sure that we're friendly to everybody and that everybody's included in this. So we thought we would come up with our a name because they ask us to come up with a name. So we're calling it the Capital Region um, Communications Project. Um, as I said before, CVPSA has done a lot of work with the Televate report for this. They're continuing um, to uh, work with Televate and hopefully pretty soon Donna um, will be awarding a contract for the next phase of this um, from Televate. We're hoping that that will be, those things will fall one thing right after another. We'll get a call from the state of Vermont and say, hey, we have found that you would be uh, eligible for $3.2 million worth of communications equipment. And we would ask the Televate folks, or hope that the Televate folks would do the RFP process for us to be able to spend that money. It's a lot, it's a lot of money. I really, um, I've been fortunate when I worked out of the area for several years that I was um, in charge of a couple of different communications projects. So I have some kind of an idea on how much this stuff costs. When I came back to Barrie, I also realized that people around us in a lot of the departments that we dispatch for, for from our, our two different areas really have no idea how much this stuff costs. It's expensive. Um, it's a lot of money and um, somebody's got to pay for it. And one of the things that we discovered early on, because we have the city managers in our group, was don't expect the city of Mary and Montpelier to, to pay for it. Um, so let's see what we can do to find some grant, grant funding out there and so forth. And so one thing kind of led into the other, and we hope that we were ready and able to answer the question and the call for the uh, Department of Public Safety when they came to us. Um, so the, the, the changes that we would like to make are to land mobile radio that's the stuff that we use today. The, that's the radios in the police cars, the radios in the fire trucks, the portable radios that the um, responders use, as well as, I'll call them for lack of a better term, the mountaintop structures, uh, antennas, and radios that are around the area, spread around the area, in order to be able to communicate and get the message out to all the surrounding departments who purchase services from our two communities. Um, again, the DPS has started out with about $11 million statewide to spread out to these um, agencies that are willing to step forward and do regional communications. Uh, they're planning on adding another $6 million to that over the next three years, I believe. And um, we're hoping that uh, our, uh, our request will be looked for favorably upon. We did this same presentation that we're doing to you tonight. We did this last night in Barrie. Uh, it seemed to be well received by our city council and they gave an affirmative nod at the end, a un unanimous affirmative nod for us to continue on this process and, and um, 
continue to partner with Montpelier and, and move this project forward if we get the opportunity to. Um, one of the things that was called out specifically in the Televate report is very nice of them to do as part of their report was they did priority one, two, and three of several different projects. One of the things that the Twin Cities team did uh, shortly after receiving this report was get together and go through this report and figure out what were the things that we needed to move on right off. Because if we added up all of the priority one projects, it was like $6.4 million. And uh, that, that number is just too staggering to even start with. So we were able to knock a few things off. And one of the things that uh, we were aware of that both cities had planned for um, was the dispatch console replacements. And so we came to an agreement among our group that both cities would bite off replacing their own consoles. We wouldn't ask the state for money to do that. Both cities would step up to the plate. And as I explained earlier, we're going to try and use the same vendor, the same equipment, and, and moving forward that way. So we crossed that off the list. And the other thing the state had said was that they would not cover the cost of any mobile or portable radios for field forces. This is really about dispatch infrastructure. So they, they selected that off the list for us as well. And in saying that, both myself in Barry and in Montpelier, Chief Pete, we've all applied for some different grants for funding of the mobile and portable radios uh, going forward. And hopefully that will come true as well. So um, we're waiting to hear on that and we're waiting to hear a little more from uh, legislature. Um, but what we have figured out between the two cities is that we both think very easily and without much change that both cities could step up and accept two or three more services to, uh, to do the dispatching for. So two to three more in Barrie and two to three more in Montpelier uh, would put us all right about at maximum capacity for what we would do. Obviously, we're not going to tell anybody uh, who needs to come with us. The state's not going to tell who you got to go with. The state's going to make the money available for different regional centers to make their upgrades necessary. And we'll, I don't know, act as an intermediary for the places that they're shedding away and say, geez, Barry's doing dispatch, Montpelier's doing dispatch. Um, we've helped fund their uh, infrastructure upgrades and um, hopefully we'll, they'll put us together with the customers that we're looking for. Um, so that's kind of the end of everything that we had put together. It's, uh, as my manager puts it, a lot of this stuff is a lot like drinking from a fire hose. It's a lot to swallow and a lot to understand all at once. But um, we have obviously Barry and Montpelier public safety officials are on board. The Barry Council stepped up last night. CVPSA, I don't know if Donna has something to say on behalf of CVPSA about this. Uh, the, the state and our key technological partners and companies have all stepped forward in, in support of this. So I'll gladly be quiet now and um, you can ask Chief Pete and I any questions that you, you may have for us or things that have come up about this. Certainly, thank you for hearing us. If I could just simply add one more thing would be that, uh, sorry, per that last slide again, um, we have been making this a very inclusive process. So as we've been, this thing has been moving at light speed um, from the state uh, and, and every day something new comes down that we have to respond to. And we, we're at the point that we're able to pull in the actual dispatchers and having these conversations of what these policies and procedures would look like and get their buy-in as well. So that includes conversations with all the dispatchers from both Barry and Montpelier to include the union itself. And the union has given us that buy-in and that, and uh, they're standing with us on that one as well. Okay, thank you. Does I'll uh, start, does anyone on the council have any questions? Yes, they are smart. I, I have a couple of questions. I'll start out with a couple of questions. Um, it, it seems to me that for a number of years we've been uh, hearing uh, hearing presentations, and one of the things we've been hearing is that uh, as long as these other towns are getting free dispatch from from the state police, 
we're not going to get them to buy our service because why would they, right? Uh, are, are we at the point now where they're getting kicked off and they're going to need to be uh, buying dispatch services? Yes, that, that's what the state has done. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, as you might imagine, this is quite a ball to pick up and carry, um, has made that statement and he has the governor on board and he has certain legislators on board that it's time for them to get out of the dispatching business um, or other than the state police. Now, are there other uh, regional uh, dis dispatch groups the way we have here in uh, central Vermont? So um, I can tell you from a PSA standpoint, there's a Chittenden County Public Safety Authority as well as the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Uh, and I only know that because I was a member of that when I was up that way. And um, Rutland has a dispatch center, but it's again, based around the state police. Rutland County is probably the biggest area of the state who is going to be left in the lurch. Uh, they are working with the state, but they are not nearly far as along as we are. Um, I don't think there's any other dispatch center in the state currently. I might be wrong, but I think there's no other in the state that have a report like the Televate report that we have to, to um, guide our way as we move forward with this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Joe's the expert on the capital okay. farm mutual aid. Uh, Deputy Chief Allsworth, Fair City Fire. I'm also the Vice President of Capital Fire Mutual Aid. Um, so Barry and Montpelier are quite unique in the state where they're using our uh, formulas, our bylaws, our contracts, and they're sharing them with the rest of the state. So we're actually quite leaders here now, uh, showing you know what we have, and the commissioner has really uh, embraced our system. The redundancy has been very huge. We've been working with Terry LaValle um, on, on the redundancy part, which is very, uh, uh, very appetizing to the state because they don't have the amount of redundancy that we have built into Barry and Montpelier. So on a lot of levels, we, we are above the rest of the uh, area. Which presumably makes us well suited to be like first in line for, uh, for these state level grants. That's what we're hoping. <laughs> yes, coupled with the Televate report, and, and some of the other stuff that we've been working on, it really does put us above the rest of the, the comp. I hate to say competition, but the other dispatch centers that are trying to, to play catch up uh -huh. onto this. Okay, thanks, Donna. But say, stay there, Joe. But with this comes envy. And so when this <laughs> bill was in the House and the commissioner in particular, the commissioner of public safety uh, wanted to advance direct payment to Chittenden and the capital region, for this infrastructure right off the gate as soon as the funding was there July 1 there was a lot of pushback so the house passed the budget with an attachment to this money saying it had to be studied that would mean it would go into study committee next year we wouldn't see money for almost two years from now so it's really important that Montpelier, Barry, everyone really work on any of the legislators to, to change that mindset and to have this budget go into conference committee to change that language, or we won't get the money. Nobody will for at least another year, two years. And, and if I may speak to Council Member Bates' uh, point on that one, part of the attrition, part of the issue with what's going on within the state's communication is the attrition rate with their dispatchers. They are woefully understaffed with dispatchers for a host of reasons, a variety of reasons. But um, one of the examples there was, what was it, Joe? Just yesterday. Just, just yesterday, yeah. VT Digger ran an article saying that the actual Williston barracks were, was no longer in a position to dispatch right now because several of their members had COVID. So, so they're dispatched. So they were dispatching by phone. Uh, you had you had troopers calling troopers on phone moving through that entire process and so we're at a we're at an urgency level right now and the beauty of what we've been doing here is we understand that everybody's rough right now with staffing we're in just in a different place in the world what we want to do is do what we can to not damage what we have here or overwork ourselves here but we want to, we we're looking at the aftec consoles that if state police had something 
in which that they weren't able to support continuity of operations, we could build a system that we could flip a switch and we could assist them in dispatching in Barry and Montpelier to any place in the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that gets to another question. Chief Brent, you said that uh, there's the capacity to uh, to add, on e for each city to add a few additional services, but but not that many. Um, what's the uh, limiting factor for uh, how many we can add? I believe it would be this, the saturation of the work by the dispatchers that are on duty and the number of dispatchers that are on duty um, at any given time. Obviously, those things change based on call volume. The call volumes are based around the fact whether they're a busy department like Barry and Montpelier have, or maybe a small uh, fire department like Woodbury or something. So obviously, they're going to require one's going to require more, and one's the other's going to require less. So we hope to be able to, as people approach us, measure those their call amounts and numbers and so forth, so that we can make sure that our staffing is appropriate without biting off too much um, because it's it's not right to put our employees in the position that they're 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 overburdened either because dispatchers jobs are hard enough uh, dispatchers when you look up multitasking in the in the dictionary I can tell you there is a public safety communicators picture next to that that word because they know multitasking like nobody else does mm -hmm. um, they've been telling me where to go for 49 years. Uh, that's on the radio, but um, uh, for, for a long time, and I have an ultimate level of respect for the dispatchers and the jobs they do. Okay, thanks. Anyone on uh, the council before we go to the public? Okay, is, uh, we'll start if there's any, anyone in the, in the room who wants to be uh, heard on this topic. Steve Whitaker again. Uh, I've spent since I think 2017 focused on this problem area. Uh, you're only getting part of the story here. You're, you're, this is a, a, an end around the regional planning that Montpelier is an obli ob obligatory member of CVPSA. And despite what Donna says, CVPSA has not blessed this uh, this end around this this is a attempt to further entrench Montpelier as the monopoly service provider for the regional towns and the regional towns, some of them are outraged at the rates that have been escalating that they have no control over. In fact, Montpelier uses capital fire as a straw man bill collector, so these towns uh, vote money too much money into their fire department their fire department then has this poorly run, poorly managed organization that aggregates the money and gives $400,000 to Montpelier annually. And, and it's growing. And the forecast in the Department of Public Safety's uh, analysis compiled by the Legislative Council or the Joint Fiscal Office is operating costs esca escalating to 1.3 or 1.5 million. Right now, we're supposedly at about 800,000 if Montpelier is indeed committing 400,000 and Capital Fire is committing 400,000. I don't have the proof of how much Montpelier is spending on it, but 800,000 to a million and a half is a big jump and that we're not at all clear on where that extra money is going to come from. The state's money does not come with any operating, ongoing operating money. That there's needed tax restructuring at the state level. So many towns are hesitant to create these dispatch operations because the operating costs are going to leave them in the lurch. And you should be, if you're doing your due diligence, you should be very cautious about that as well. So uh, the failover, the, the fiber optic line is buzzword, buzzy as that sounds. It does nothing right now. It provides a little bit of data exchange. But there's no interoperability. There's no way for Barry to dispatch Montpelier's traffic or Barry, Montpelier's traffic to dispatch Barry's. Those radios are not connected. Those consoles are not up to the standard that could do remote control. Like they might be someday, but they're not now. So that pretense of failover is pure hooey. You know, uh, the city council has not 
agreed to act as a contract manager for this Televate. Not that, not at any meeting that I've been at, and yet people are being told that the city, I've got it in transcript, Donna Bate telling Senate GovOps that the city is on board to act as the contract administrator to spend CVPSA's money to buy a new $30,000 contract from Televate, which is 10,000 above the policy ceiling for where it should go out to bid. Televate shortchanged us on the last report. They didn't come in with an inventory of equipment. They didn't tell us what equipment was about to fail or where we could get spare parts. They didn't measure the height of the antennas on the tower or the condition of the grounding. So we got ripped off by Televate. And now Donna has railroaded this thing in to give them another 30,000 above a $20,000 ceiling on an adopted policy requiring bid. So, covered that, covered that. This is inconsistent with regional governance and a regional plan. The, the surrounding towns that are the customers need to have a vote in how this is managed and who operates it. Just already, okay, let's talk about capacity. Montpelier has three seats and dispatches for 20 something towns. Barry has three seats and dispatches for three towns, but Barry in no way could handle their three towns plus 20 new towns data traffic uh pit dispatching traffic all at the same time even if they had those radio connections right now so i'm glad to see bill writing so furiously so that he can uh spin this for you and so well let me get to what is your bottom line that you think we should you should we you, should disapprove you should not what they're approve saying approve this i'll also you should not approve or give any blessing to this until you've done due diligence you're getting spun by the city's conflict of interest on trying to maintain control of this dispatch while we, the city has obligations to a regional authority that we're a member of. If you want to vote to get out of it, that's a townwide vote you considered, and then it takes a year to execute. In the meeting, meantime, the city has obligations to continue to proceed on a regional. And the city has never agreed to buy a radio system for remote towns. If, if you're basically funding a multi-million dollar entrepreneurial uh, enterprise, the city's contract with Capital Fire has been what provided the radio system to reach Walden and Cabot and, and Woodbury. That's a radio system that the city doesn't own. So in fact, the city won't own it even, well, it depends on who, who's the applicant for the money. Also, the house asked to study the house asked to study before the 11 million spent to figure out what the best regional dispatch operation is because clearly this is not a transparent or or accountable governance structure this straw man approach where somebody collects the money somebody else and errors get swept under the rug we've had deadly errors we've had life-threatening errors in this dispatch that i've dug out through public records requests and the chief says, oh, no, we, we don't know anything about it. We don't keep any, we don't keep track of it. I've got that in writing. He doesn't keep track of errors. That's outrageous. Okay. The, the committee that's supposed to be governing this contract hasn't met, warned a meeting, or kept minutes in all the years that it's been in existence. Okay, thank you. We're up to about six minutes now. Uh, uh, we have another uh, person, uh, Kim Cheney. Thank you. I've been on the CVPSA board for and please six identify years. yourself. Signed up for another three. Um, Kim, could you identify yourself, please, for the viewers? Oh, Kimberly Cheney. Thank you. Um, I want to start off by saying I am delighted to see people working together, and to hear the cities working together. And it was CVPSA that stimulated that. Didn't happen before CVPSA said, we need to have a plan. And so I'm happy to see it come to some fruition. But this is not a regional plan. Um, it's 
you can't plan, I don't think, reasonably plan to spend six to eight million dollars on a handshake. There needs to be agreements, there needs to be a governance structure. And I've been, frankly, um, distressed on the CBA, CBPSA board because I don't get any information about what's going on. So if this is going to be a regional effort, the so-called working group has been a dodge for avoiding public records and public um, accountability. Um, and at the very least, the city should make them a committee of the legislature, and they should hold warned meetings, and they should let other people know what's going on and we should be able to read their reports. Uh, I think it's more of a wish list. This all depends on getting grants which have not been awarded and there's considerable controversy in the legislature. I would say the legislature is in a froth there's many plans, many different groups, and they're grappling about how to create better infrastructure. Uh, I was surprised when Chief Bent said that the money from uh, the commissioner didn't include, didn't require a, a PSAP. I heard the commissioner myself and government operations said that unless I misunderstood something, the money coming to Montpelier was uh, going to be a public answering system. And some of that would pay for those dispatchers. And then I heard discussions about taking over the fourth floor at National Life for the dispatching. And This needs to be vented, it needs to be public, and it needs to be regional. People have been very kind to uh, Televate today, and I'm a big supporter of Televate. I think they did what we asked them to do. We didn't ask them to do a detailed engineering study, which they're now going to fill in some of those holes. But there's no governance for this plan. There's no central manager and director who has actually authority to do anything. And I, I understand that um, may, maybe things have changed. They didn't even have a contract with uh, Capital Fire. Is there a contract signed? We tried to get one. Uh, we, I mean, I and other members of CVPSA, uh, I wanted to see the contract. I and I don't think one's been signed. So what you have in front of you is hoping that Santa Claus is going to come down the Christmas tree and give the cities, all the money and the surrounding towns to build a system that meets current standards. And that may happen, but it's a long way from seeing the, the light of day that I can see. And I don't claim to be an expert on the legislative process because I just haven't followed it that closely. But the one or two contacts I've had with it, including, by the way, a meeting with the uh, E1911 board, oh. um, there are so many subjects up in the air, and nobody seems to, to me to be as willing to replicate an antiquated system. I say, you know, look, we've got millions that is floating around here for 
broadband, some of that could be used to help uh, public safety. And it all needs to be coordinated in some way. Okay, uh, we're up to five or six minutes. That's what the legislature is trying to do. So my last word is glad to see the cooperation. I think it's a great idea, but this is a wish list. It isn't a plan. Okay, thank you. Um, Justin Dressler. They won't let me. Oh, there it goes. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, hey everyone, Justin Dreschler. I'm a member of the CEPSA also. Um, I find myself in the position that I'm often in, which is agreeing this with Mr. Whitaker, but for um, reasons different than what he has articulated. Uh, first, I think it is wonderful that Twin Cities is actually making progress. Um, if anyone sits in on those CEPSA meetings, the idea that we would go even one more minute with the antiquated infrastructure that we have should be offensive to everybody. And it is, it's such a big step forward and it's so great. Uh, that said, uh, the CVPSA is the Central Public Safety Authority. The charter envisions that authority managing regional public dispatch. Um, and it's okay that that doesn't seem to be on the roadmap anymore. But from my perspective, as someone who is a volunteer on that committee and who is putting in a lot of time to it and watching the other members of the committee put in 20 times more time than I put into it, it would really help me if there was some clarity in terms of what role we're supposed to play, what role this Twin Cities committee is supposed to play, and how we're all going to make this happen together. So if CVPSA if the vision for CVPSA is not to be some regional public safety authority anymore, which it does not appear to be, and pretty much everyone agrees that with that, but doesn't say it out loud, then let, can we just say it? Can we just all get in a room together and say it so that we're not out here killing ourselves it, for no point? If we have these meetings and we talk about what is our plan? What are we going to do? We are going to do nothing. Right now, what we are is we are a checkbook for funding studies and the Tel Aviv study was very useful for that, that purpose, but we are not in authority and we have no authority. And Whitaker is right. Montpelier are the, I signed on as a member of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority and yet is taking actions inconsistent with the Regional Public Safety Authority. And I understand why they're doing that. And I personally happen to agree with the fact that they're doing that because something needs to get got done and there's absolutely no buy-in for a regional public safety authority. Uh, but somebody's got to say it out loud because otherwise we're just going to be on this committee wasting our time, wasting each other's time. And I want the committee to be what it can be and to not try to be more than it can be. So if we are going to move forward with this, I would really ask the city council to clarify everybody's roles and, um, just so that we know where we're going and so we know where we, what we can provide in terms of help because it's um it's very frustrating it's very frustrating without that clarity so if you could just provide that that would be really wonderful thank Thanks, you sir. thank you everyone for all the work you've done on it thank you chief thank you doug thank you everyone it's, it really is it's great work. thank you donna especially thanks now i heard a bunch of questions raised and i think i saw some wheels turning to answer some of those questions uh donna why don't you start well i guess where i'd like to start is we were here in montpelier chamber in january 20th and we had this discussion whether montpelier wanted to withdraw from the public safety authority and the answer was no the council wasn't ready you, you saw merit in the regional future of regionalization. But for the past seven years, 2015, that's much longer than that, um, every time the Public Safety Authority has come before either Barry or Montpelier Council, you have voted not to give it operating authority. So we have been on a mission to do administrative duties, such as the studies with Televate, such as the training for dispatchers. We thought it was important, you may not have realized it, but your dispatchers were not certified. We wanted them to go through a standardized federal process, Barry and Montpelier to get them on the same playing field. When we started, even Montpelier with all their uh, 
advanced thinking about dispatching and having a supervisor for dispatcher didn't have processes written down. So we feel we've nudged a lot of progress. We've nudged Barry and Monte are talking more. Tony uh, Fakus, the previous police chief, was really appreciative of that factor. So we have filled other niches, but we have gone on so long without the councils giving the public safety authority any authority to advance a central regional dispatch center that we now have no staff. We've been operating without staff for three years. We have no credibility. When we went to the ban bank bonding banks, bonding <laughs> banks, they said, no, we can't give you money. So we knew that either Barry or Montpelier had to do any kind of capital acquisition would have to go through one of the cities. Montpelier said, well, we're willing to work with our Capital West customers and see if we can advance some equipment funding. So from the standpoint of where the Public Safety Authority wants regionalization, we desperately want this equipment to be replaced. And tonight, what we're talking about is not Public Safety Authority existence. It's about antiquated equipment that is in the hands of our dispatchers and our first responders. That, to me, takes precedent over territory. And that I, as a chair, feel like everything the Public Safety Authority Board has worked for and once is to improve public safety for residents and for the first responders. They are all vulnerable with this equipment, folks. So I don't care who they want to give it to, but it'll come and serve my first responders in central Vermont, my residents, my friends, I'm all for it. And so I say, uh, why do we want to resist getting this capital money? We're replacing radios. We're not adding any operational cost at this point. We're not asking you to go out and take 20 towns on. We're saying we've got a chance for infrastructure to replace antiquated equipment. I don't get where this other peripheral discussion comes from. I'm just focused on, seriously, folks, you know, Doug Hoyt always said, our public safety equipment is put together with safety pins. No one would allow this to be in their house. <laughs> this kind of equipment. And so I'm back to that, really. Justin, others have raised questions about public safety authority, relationship with the cities, great, but not now. Now we have a chance, a short window with the legislators, and they are, they're confused, it's a lot of technical stuff, they're getting a lot of mixed messages, and I would like to see Barry Montpelier and all your customers getting after their legislators and helping our legislators have clarity. This is a chance we'll never get again. Uh, I just really want us to jump on this together and say, let's go for the equipment. We know that Barry and Montpelier have the credentials to take in the money to, to administrate the grant. I just don't know why we wouldn't want to do it. Thank you, <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> I just want to add a couple of technical points here. Uh, I'm not going to refute all the comments. Um, but I guess the, the crux of this is nobody is asking the city council tonight to approve spending five or six million dollars. Um, we're based, so I think the request is number one, you support the concept. We're seeking a grant for $3.2 million from the legislature for uh, the region, uh, which is not the cities correctly spoke it. Uh, maybe we'll get it, maybe we won't. We hope, we hope we will, maybe we'll get part of it and we'll have to figure that out. There are three separate aspects. So one, uh, which Chief Brent talked about, one is the consoles. We have antiquated consoles. Uh, they don't communicate with each other. Mr. Whitaker is correct, uh, particularly well. That's why we're seeking to purchase new consoles that not only communicate with one another, but with the state police. And you may recall, we had this in our budget a year ago. Objections were raised to the purchase at that time, and the council put it on hold. So our specific ask for tonight, actually, is to, for the approval to go ahead uh, and, and work, you know, to get approval to actually purchase consoles when we're, we're ready to purchase them. The second aspect is the radios that our, our police and fire use, particularly fire. Um, you've heard this, the tales where radios don't work inside of buildings. Uh, it, it's very dangerous. We've asked 
each each community has asked for approximately half of the million dollars from the Department of Homeland Security and grants. That's right. Are we waiting for Santa Claus? Yes, we're not asking for a million dollars now. We're asking you to support that effort to try to obtain that important funding. And lastly, we're seeking to provide ad, added infrastructure for the region as per the Televate report, as created by CVPSA, given the governing votes that have occurred prior to now. Um, so, you know, I think, as Donna said, we're trying to improve the infrastructure, give all of our folks the tools uh, to provide help to the region. And uh, this, you know, if we are given, if we are successful in obtaining $3.2 million for the infrastructures, that pay, you know, that's for the town's benefit, really, as much as for us, it's going all, all to the infrastructure. So that's money that all those member towns will not have to come up with. Um, so we are trying to look at this from a regional benefit. And um, so I think, you know, the ask tonight is, does the city council support or continue to support this effort? And will you authorize us um, to proceed uh, as when appropriate with the consoles, um, which was put on hold last year? That's it. And so I think to make more of this is really overstating the case. Yes, we're waiting to see if we get out external funding. We're not going to spend a million dollars on radios and $3.2 million on regional equipment if we don't receive the funding. We will seek other funding plans or come back or put it in the budget or do whatever. But right now, this is the effort that's here. We're asking for your expression that you're either on board or not because that helps us in seeking funding. Connor. Yeah, I think it. it be irresponsible to leave this money on the table and we do need to move forward. Um, I would say I, I, I totally hear Justin, I hear Kim, I hear others. I, you know, every time CVPSA comes in here, we, we smack them down and we don't give clarity of what they should be doing. So I'd be very frustrated as well, I think, if I was sitting on this committee. Uh, but that said, I, I'd like to make a motion to um, authorize the city manager to purchase the dispatch consoles. I, I think we do need another conversation about CVPSA. So no. Would you, did you did you mean and to support all of these grant efforts is part of that? Of course, yeah. That's what I thought I heard. Yeah. <laughs> second. It's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yes, Lauren. Just, just I mean, I, thank you to everyone who's doing this. It's really exciting to see. I feel like a lot of the previous conversations on this topic have been you know, challenges with how CVPSA is working and stuff. So seeing just progress getting the equipment our communities need is really exciting and I'm happy to support it and appreciate the input we've gotten. And I think the cities, Montpelier and Barry, revisiting the mission and scope of CVPSA makes total sense to have a future conversation about soon to give clarity to the members of that. So appreciate that feedback too, but thank you all for what you're doing. Okay, ready to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion is carried. Thank you. And thank you for coming in. Thanks, Thanks to all the folks from Barry. Yeah. While they're uh, gathering their things and leaving, the next item on the agenda is um, number. 11, also known as uh, number 16, the uh, uh, <laughs> Elks, Elks Club process. They changed the order. Every time yeah. I see Michael with that box and think oh, okay. pizza, and then I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Isn't there a public hearing warrant for 645 and what time is it now? I don't know that it's warned for a particular time. It is 714 now. We will take up the zoning second public hearing after the item that we're about to take up. It was warned for a specific time. Okay, thank you. You warned that for a specific time. Start them after. They can start after. Wow. 
Okay. Are we ready to go? I think I'm ready to go. Thank you. All right. So I'm Mike Miller. I'm the director of planning and community development. And so um, tonight, um, in addition to the zoning, um, I just wanted to, I've been asked to kind of go through a quick presentation of how municipalities do projects. And this is really to, to try to help the community and city council understand, you know, what's a roadmap of what we should be looking at for the former Elks Club property. Um, so today, real quick, um, I'm going to discuss municipal, municipal projects in general. And really the take home message there is we're going to break things into a couple of big pieces, big steps, plan, prepare, then implement. And it makes makes sense. Sounds simple, but we'll go into some of the details. I'll also talk a little bit about proposing a path forward for the former Elks Club land. Then we have a staff request um, for council to consider, and then we'll take some questions. So uh, I'm starting with a couple of examples. Seems to be Berry City night here. So um, based on my experience in Barry City. And I chose these because these are projects that um, the, the image on the left is the old Wayland's Drug. It's an old uh, Rite, Rite Aid building uh, that had been burned out. And we turned that into an 80,000 square foot office building with 400 jobs. And we did that in four years. So big projects are, are things that can happen if they happen in a certain way and they can happen in a timely basis. Another project at the same time as that one was going on, we did Enterprise Alley. This is where the all fired up restaurant used to be. It was an old dry cleaner, terrible brownfield. Um, again, another project that we designed, prepared and implemented in that same five year period. And so I have experience with how to kind of keep projects moving efficiently. And so I wanted to just, based on my experience, give a little bit of an understanding of as we think about big projects, how can we make this move most efficiently? So, uh, you know, a little bit of a projects process overview. Um, again, the key is to break projects into three big steps. One is to plan, then we're gonna prepare, then we're gonna implement. And a lot of this makes sense. You're like, of course, that's the way we would do it. Except that a lot of times what you'll find communities do is they might go ahead and pursue funding to build a project, and then say, okay, well, we have $5 million. Let's start planning and decide how we want to spend $5 million, as opposed to starting with a plan and then finding the funding you need to do the project you want. You rarely end up with the project you want if you work backwards. Um, it also takes longer. You're more likely to run into hurdles if you get money to build a project, but you haven't studied what your site conditions are or what the other costs might be. So working in a specific order, plan, prepare, implement is very important for everybody to, to keep in mind. How long each step de depends on the specifics of each project. Certain projects we are re relatively easy to plan. Um, you know, If you're just gonna build a sidewalk on Route 302 from the roundabout to uh, the wayside, pretty easy. We just have to decide which side of the street to put it on. Um, really quick to plan, preparing and implementing may take more time. Other projects, um, are going to need more time in the preparation or more time in the implementation, depending on what the project is. And for major projects, like the one we're considering for the Elks Club land, think about at least one year for each step. We're going to spend a year just doing our planning, and it's, it's critical, and we'll go into each one of these steps. Um, so the first step, planning. I'll, I'll say this over and over again. This is the most important step, the one most people want to skip, Nobody wants to talk about planning. We want to get going. We want to start building things. Um, and the outcome of this step is an agreed upon conceptual plan. And this is where all your public input um, is, is gathered. This is where public input is vital. Um, because by the time we get to these other steps in the future, most of those are implementing steps. 
Um, so this, we're going to gather ideas from the public. We're going to evaluate opportunities and constraints. That's what staff would do. We're going to present the findings back to the public with options. We're going to narrow those options and present final options for recommendation to the public and council, and then council makes a decision. And then we build a, a final conceptual plan, which is graphic rich um, and detailed. So I put this together uh, from, from, again, back from Barry City. If you were looking at the right side of this screen, that's where City Hall is and City Hall Park and, and Youth Triumphant. Um, and on the left side, you'd have just off the screen the, the, the courthouse. Um, the dark block is the new city place. So this was the conceptual plan that was put together for Merchants Row, Enterprise Alley, and um, the areas on north of North Main Street there. And the purpose of this is not to um, answer every question and get every detail, but really to lay out conceptually, this is what we are looking for. Um, and if you knew the site before, you'd kind of be able to look at it and go through and say, um, you'll see a note on the bottom that says bike path. Um, so we would be answering questions in the conceptual phase that goes and says, okay, what do we want to see in Enterprise Alley? We want a sidewalk on one side and a bike path on the other. We're going to weigh generalized things like um, we could have 120 cars in this parking lot, but if we have a bike path, we can only fit 110. Are we willing to sacrifice 10 parking spaces for a bike path? Those are the conceptual plan issues. We Now, where, where every detail goes isn't there, but we need to have an understanding of are we going to be having a bike path or are we not going to have a bike path? Because then we can move forward later on to work on that. That's what these conceptual plans help to do for you. Um, they're typically done by or in coordination with the landscape architect. Um, they're used to doing these types of, of large scale projects. Um, this is where a lot of preliminary studies are done. Could be parking studies. And in the case of Enterprise Alley, it was a lot of questions on parking, soils, economic studies, utility capacities. We're looking at order of magnitude costs. These are things that are going to say, if we did this, 10 to $15 million, two to $3 million. We don't have exact numbers, but we have to have an idea because usually we're comparing options. Do we want option A that costs $5 million and is okay, or do we want the $10 million project that looks really nice? And they're just um, some preliminary studies, order of magnitude costs. It's not an exact representation. The details will evolve as the final plan is prepared. But why is this important? because it makes sure everybody's on the same page. If we talk about things just in words, in, in things, I might think of a housing, housing for 200 units as a lot of multifamily housing, but somebody else might go through and say, oh, I was thinking 200 single family homes. And somebody else might be thinking uh, something different when they're thinking of housing. By putting it down in paper, and it's not just the picture, the conceptual plan um, actually, had one here. Um, this was one of the ones that was put out for um, City Place, the construction of City Place. So the final plan is more than just the picture, but that picture is important. Um, so it's important to make sure everybody is on the same page with what we're all trying to do. Um, that makes my job as staff much easier later on because I'm just being told, build this. We've all decided this is what we're going for. Let's move forward on it. There are a lot of hurdles to get there, but we know what we're doing. The graphic plans help greatly to improve the ability to get <laughs> grants. Uh, it shows grant funders a level of public input that has been conducted, and both of these really add up to getting a lot of grants and a lot of money um, behind projects. Um, and that was my experience in Barry City for both of those projects, among a, a number of other projects that I worked on there. Um, this sets up the next steps preparation so staff can move forward on um, projects to implementation, which is difficult to do if we don't have a clear vision of where we're going. So the second step um, is preparation. This starts falling more on staff and consultants. We begin to write the grants. We start refining plans. We're doing more detailed studies. Now that we know what we're doing, we can start spending more money on those more detailed plans. Um, we move into engineering and architectural plans. We develop more detailed cost estimates and eventually getting into permitting, rezoning, bonding, all of those pieces that are going to take us 
and get us ready for um, some of the final pieces. We also, in the second step, will begin outreach and coordination with partners and potential partners. Um, presentations to the public and council at this step are more about progress reports and any refinements. So again, as I, as I was pointing out, that first step, this first year is the year for public input because we have to find out what the public wants and what we all are gonna agree on what we're doing because by the time we get to the preparation steps, it's really more about the refinements and progress reports. And then finally, we get to the third step, the big step. This is where we start moving into the bids. This is where you've got your public works folks um, who are very experienced at doing bids and construction, um, getting involved and moving things forward. Um, for the, the Elks Club, um, this could mean in the implementation, selling of building lots, signing development agreements, building roads and utilities. Um, and I'll point out because we own the lots, we didn't really know where to talk about this, but we wanted to just mention this third step is because we own these building lots, we have a lot of control over what happens depending on how we write development agreements. Um, and I, one of the other reasons I wanted to pick, pick out and pick on the, the city place project that I was so involved with in Barry city was because um, that project, we owned the lot, we owned everything. So we had a public process for approving the designs, which you couldn't do if it was just a regular project, but because we own the land, we could have a public pro process to approve the designs. We could require some public amenities that otherwise wouldn't be required. Um, it's, uh, it's, it provides us a lot of control over what happens when we get there. Um, and these would be happening in the third step, not in the first step, but in the third step. When we get there, we can start having a lot more control over, over how we move forward with implementation. Um, public input at this point is really progress reports. By this point, we've already decided what to do. We already have our Act 250 permits. We already have our zoning permits, and we've got bulldozers pushing dirt around. So uh, at this point, most of what you'd be seeing is probably um, a, a project person who would be coming in and giving you updates as to where things are going. Um, if implementation is broken into phases, which it might be, then this might happen over a set of years. So implementation could be something that takes three, four, five, seven, ten years, depending on on how the, the build out is for something like uh, the Elks Club. Um, so now a little bit more getting specifically the next steps for the Elks Club. Um, as, as many everybody knows, or, or many of you know, we had uh, the ideas and kickoff session already. We had this gathering ideas step. It was very well attended. Um, and now what we would be doing next is coming with our public feedback process. So we'll, this is what would happen for that first year. We have to have our follow-up meeting and evaluate those ideas with the public. Um, and then we need to start shifting into evaluating opportunities and constraints. We need to have staff and consultants start to look at the site constraints, start to look at what we see on the ground, start doing some preliminary studies um, so we can bring back some findings to the public later on so we can start talking about, um, all right, what do the options look like? We knew what we wanted for ideas. Some of those might not pan out because of site constraints. So we need to have a presentation that says this is what we found on the ground. Um, then we're going to narrow the options and come back with final options and recommendations to the public and council um, before we have a, a, a final vote. Um, provide clarity around the role of the hub. At this point, this is, this is kind of sitting a little bit outside this process. We have to figure out how um, the, the hub is going to fit into this whole process. Um, and then we would present a final conceptual plan, again, very graphic rich and detailed, that will let us be ready for the next step. Um, to do this first step, we would need to hire a project consultant to coordinate the development of the conceptual plan. Um, this is going to be needed because we're going to need to have somebody who's going to be managing and establishing clear channels of communication, um, web pages, front porch forum posts, Facebook, um, CAN, capital area na um, neighborhoods, and Polco. Um, why would we hire somebody? It's going to be a lot more efficient at hiring subs, and our staff really lack the time and experience in this type of development. So one of the key things is, is if we hire somebody to be the project coordinator, it gives them the flexibility to then um, do certain subs by hiring certain environmental subs to do the, the 
soil borings and all these other things, it gets us out of the job of doing 50 RFPs um, for each one of these different steps. So uh, that's what a consultant would start to work on. Um, there is separately at the same time where we have the recreation master plan, which is still an open and evolving process. We haven't entirely nailed down whether this gets built into our conceptual plan. We do everything at the same time. That kind of puts some things on a hold, some, you know, some um, recreation things people want to get started on faster. Um, so we still have to sort out this process of how the recreation master plan will be built into this greater master plan for the property. And the goal is to have the conceptual plan done by this time next year. That would be, um, I, I think that's a good time frame. Um, it, it would make sure we have given the public plenty of time to um, see the options, give input. Um, we could have multiple hearings to talk about what this conceptual plan is. And it's very important we don't rush the conceptual plan. Um, we really need to make sure that uh, everybody, if, if, if we've had complaints about things, you know, from, from stuff in the past, is that stuff has been rushed. This, this is an opportunity we don't have to rush it. So let's look at trying to make sure we take a good amount of time to get a, a plan. Not everybody's going to agree on everything, um, but we need a plan that we uniformly say, this is where we're moving forward on, so staff has good direction. Um, the preparation starts in 2023. That's next year. We're, we already know there's likely to be zoning changes that would be needed. It's likely we're going to be applying for Act 250. There are some state de designations we could apply for that would help us in implementing this, um, but it depends what comes out of the conceptual plan. The, the conceptual plan that looks one way might be an NDA, another plan might be a new town center, another plan might be um, expanding the growth center. There are a number of programs we could get in to help implementation. We would also be exploring grant opportunities and partnerships during 2023. Um, and that may take a little bit longer. Act 250 is a, could be a longer process. Um, we hope it's it's relatively um, succinct, but um, you know we're looking at one year for preparations, and then two years from now, if if everything went well, we would be uh, starting to look at the implementation phases. A big project like this is going to be likely broken into phases. We'd probably develop, you know, let's say the lower part first. We might construct roads or utilities. There might be some selling of lots and development. This would really depend on what comes out of the first two steps. So what is our request for tonight? So staff would like the council to direct the manager to create a funding plan for the project and to develop a request for proposals to hire a project manager to, co to coordinate public input and to develop the conceptual plans for the former Elks Club property. So it's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's, it's really basically we need the funding to hire the consultant to yeah, move this to the next forward. Clarify that we, we didn't mean a funding plan for the entire project. We meant no. for the consultant developing the consultant, <laughs> the consultant <laughs> portion of the project. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not. Yeah, this is just for developing the conceptual plan. We we need to develop the conceptual plan. We're just looking at this first step, um, and uh, in in the. Uh, in your cover sheet, I did point out the fact that we do have $50,000 in our budget for economic development, some or most or all of that. I, I don't know how much of it's already been allocated, but there is a set of funding that could be applied to this, um, towards this. I, it'll probably be more than 50000 but we'll see when we do the RFP process. And that is what I had. So. And questions can probably be from me or Bill or or Cameron. On. Okay, thanks, Bill. Any any questions up front, Connor? Yeah, thanks very much, Mike. That's very very Mike, thoughtful. Sorry. I think. Um, you, you know, one thing we know for sure is the building on Barry Street probably doesn't have a future as far as providing some of the same functions that it currently does. So I, I'm wondering, as we're doing this plan, is there going to simultaneously is there going to be a plan to replace sort of the functions because you know i wouldn't want another year of planning for the uh place on barry street uh after we figure out what we're doing with the the, the rec pieces of it i'd love to get affordable housing something in there you know pretty quick 
Yeah. I think that's something we could. That's something we could certainly need to consider as part of the planning process. Obviously, there will be a lag time from the time we decide what's going to happen before something is built and things actually move out. Sure. So you know that. So we may make a decision over the next year that we let's say that we're going to put a new rec center at the site, but then we've got to get the funding, go to voters, build it. Over those two years, we have plenty of time to sort of plan for the rec center. So I'm not sure it's as urgent, but it absolutely has a lot of you know residual uses and things that we need to consider. It's got to be part of this process. Yes. Great, thanks. I think that's a Sorry. Go ahead. My enthusiasm. Oh, that's a great She's complimenting idea. Complimenting me, let her speak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that, I, that's how clever. I mean, that's really maximizing the time we're all spending for everybody, citizens as well, to come and talk about both spaces. I really hope that we could forward that kind of approach. Maybe it's not manageable, but I'd like to try it. <laughs> you, yeah, Lauren. Um, yeah, thank you, Mike. I appreciate the extensive public input, and I was really just thrilled by the participation and a lot of great ideas at the first public forum. So I think being able to really incorporate and like thoughtfully spend the time planning, even though I know you know we all want to see housing yesterday, but taking the time to do it right makes all the sense in the world. The only question I had about the um, funding request. So are, is it just just for the budget for hiring the consultant or all the sub grants the consultant would need well, to do the planning the, for the, the year budget for the planning process. So the yes. okay. So that's, thanks. So uh, Mike, uh, who are the consultants? Are, are there consultants around the state who do this kind of work? And uh, what if we were to find someone that we like? What what kind of timeline would we expect to get someone in and starting with the process? I think that's what we would probably discover in the RFP process. I mean, we've done these conceptual plans before. Some of you remember uh, SE Group did our um, downtown master plan. Um, that was about a, a sixty thousand dollar, sixty five, seventy thousand dollar project. You know, and they did it in about a year. Um, but we've done other. Um, the um, Greeny America's Capitals was ORW. That was another one that they came in for about uh, uh, you know six months and did a downtown master plan based on um, the redoing of the, the think, 2000. The plan. question was how soon would what would be the timeline before we identified who was doing it, not how long. Uh, it would oh, take how to long it. to get somebody? Uh, I well, we've got some. We, we've got somebody we've been talking to who is going to help us with the RFP. So we do have somebody who's in, in the development field who does this type of work, who has said, you know, they, they could be interested in applying, but they also are very interested in just helping us put the RFP together so we can get, get consultants. Mm -hmm. But yes, there are, there are a number of firms out there that could fill this role. Okay, thanks. Anyone else up front? Uh... Any members of the public who, uh, I'm sorry? Yep, do you mind if I say one more? No, go ahead. No. Um, and I, I really like the pace this is moving because I think it gives, you know, the tortoise wins a race here, gives people time to take a bit of a breath. Um, you know, I one constituent, I see she's on now, Callie, and uh, she, she was great. She said, I, I voted against this, you know, I voted against it, but, it, but I, I'm invested in making it like the best it can be. And I'm really worried about some of the, you know, wildlife up in the area. And I know we're going to disrupt it, but let, let, let's disrupt it as thoughtfully as possible and do a bit of an analysis of that. So I, I would just want to make sure like some of our committees as well are in the, on the front lines on this too. And able to offer input, you know, if we bring the tree board in to do an analysis or something, I, I think we have time to do it with the, the way you've laid it out, but I would just emphasize uh, let's get those volunteer committees uh, coming up with ideas right off the bat here. Great. Yeah, and I guess I would follow that up with just a quick statement of saying that this, the conceptual plan process should take as long as it needs to. So, you know, as much as I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, by saying a year, I'm just trying to give everybody an expectation that goes and says, you know, okay, we're, we're, it's not, it's not boom, 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 boom. And we're trying to build by next year. You know, some people may want us to be building by next year and I'll be saying, no, we really, our best thing is to go slow. But 
Um, the most important thing is that when the conceptual plan is approved and handed to staff and the consultants to implement, that we have the support of council and the public behind it because that makes those next steps go faster. Um, the last thing we want to be doing is second guessing and revisiting designs and revisiting things because um, that that just bogs down getting your permits if you're changing your designs all the time. Um, so the the most efficient way of doing this is to make sure we've got good buy-in from the public, good buy-in from the council, and we've taken all the time that we need. And if we can do it in eight months, that's awesome. But I'm thinking it's got to be probably a year. But if it took a year and a half, then it's what it takes to get to make sure we are at the right point to move it forward. And you know, part of the, that process is in addition to a sort of public process about ideas is the evaluation of you know where are the wetlands what are the important wildlife areas you know that that's what some of the consultant work so it won't necessarily be public meetings but it will be saying you know here's best places to build you know most difficult places to build so uh, making sure we have a full understanding of the site constraints and the site uh, opportunities um, there a uh, couple things i wanted to just mention on this number one um just a public we mentioned we have uh, found a person to uh, replace Kevin Casey, a guy named Josh Jerome, who has worked Montpelier resident and, and works in time. He's got a lot of experience in this work, so he'll probably be one of our. You know, we will have a lead staffer. Uh, really, I mean, in addition to Mike and Cameron and I. Uh, secondly, Mike quickly mentioned Polco, and I know I mentioned this a little bit at the last meeting when you approved the contract. We have a we have a kickoff meeting with them Friday, but this is a new bit of technology we're getting. And it's going to be very important, uh, I think, very helpful for this kind of community process. You can you can really put out regular polling and options, and people can can feedback. You can also feed out information on a real regular basis, uh, as well as doing the the full. We're going to do the full community survey, but that will be about all sorts of things, not just this project. But we'll we can really have a pretty steady diet of not only sending out information, but getting two way communication, as well as obviously follow up meetings. So. We're, we're really um, looking looking forward to that. And lastly, I did want to mention the hub. It was in, in, in the post. You know, we met with them yesterday. And I'll remind everyone that you know, there is no formal agreement between the city and the hub. And we've made no commitments, uh, to, nor are they to us. Uh, but we have been in regular conversation with them. And it was actually their initiative that got people thinking. And I, you know, I know they would like to get going on their ideas sooner rather than later. And you know, we tried to be as clear as possible that we, the city, weren't in a position to commit to that. That we had a, we had a process. But the one thing I did say to them, and I would say to you, is that I think we owe them some clarity at some reasonable point in the future as to how we view going forward with them. Um, you know, whether it's you're just part of the mix, or yeah, we're going to allow you to go forward, or we're not interested, whatever it might be. Uh, I wouldn't. I don't think we need to do that tonight. Although several of them are here, and may want to talk about that. But you know, they've worked hard and they've put together a plan, and they've got donations, and, and they've got you know uh, something. And um, and frankly, if not for them, we probably wouldn't have thought of this property. So I, I do feel that we need to be, we need to give them the kindness of clarity, even if it's not the answer that they don't like, or if it's an answer they like, but. Just make sure that's on our radar for the relatively near future. Donna. My question is follow up of Bill. Is what Hub is asking more clarity than I want to be partners with you, but I don't know what it looks like? Um, well, there's, there's <laughs> but, but I also it? may have other nonprofits and other organizations well, so I want to be partners with? Correct. So I, I, there are people of, from the Hub here that could probably speak more clearly for what the hub is looking for than I can and, and should. What I would say is, I believe, and I think I'm, I'm correct, the hub has plans, and they've got some funders, and they're, they're working it, and they'd like to get going. They'd like to start, they're seeking grants, they'd like to maybe start renovating the building this year and putting programs in and, you know, maybe starting making plans to build their building. That is way ahead of our process. So. For that to happen, we would have to say, okay, we're carving this portion out and allowing you to go forward. We may or may not want to say that. So I think what what we need, so they should, they should have, we owe them the courtesy of saying, 
you're part of our planning process and it's going to be a year, year and a half, or we're going to let you do this, or we're just going to put this all out to be, you know, whatever we're going to say to them. And, and you know, they've heard me say this, so I'm not surprising them with any of this, but I don't know that we, there's, I don't believe there's a single answer that we owe them, but I believe we owe them the clarity of where we're heading so they can make their plans accordingly, even if their plans are just sit for a year. Um, they, they deserve to know that. Okay. Um, thanks. All right. right. We're at the time for comment from public, starting with the people in the room. My name's Nat Winthrop. I'm uh, vice chair of the hub. Um, the chair, uh, Ethan Atkin, is also here and available to answer any questions. We're just a sidebar to this much bigger project, this much bigger discussion that you're embarking on. Um, you know, we're interested in being able to do something in partnership with the city on 10 acres or less of this 138 acre parcel. And as Bill, thank you for that introduction. Um, we feel like we've had to put everything on hold pending the outcome of the bond issue, the bond vote. Uh, now that that has passed, we've started picking up momentum again, making progress. Um, we submitted a three-year grant application to the National Life of Vermont Foundation for a total of $120,000 over those three years, mainly focused on renovating the existing building, the old Elks Clubhouse. We did get a sign off from Bill and Cameron uh, before submitting that proposal, but with the understanding that it's not a firm commitment, it's a tentative commitment um, to allow us to uh, lease that building and a small amount of acreage around that building near the parking lots um, to be able to get our project going so that the building and all of the land doesn't uh, merely lie fallow, so to speak, over the next three to four years, as Mike was uh, outlining. Um, as Bill referred, we brought this idea to the city, uh, not as a proposal, but more as a courtesy to let uh, the folks at City Hall know what we were planning to do in terms of uh, to create a fairly ambitious recreation and social hub up on this property. And this was at the time when the city was looking at the uh, possibly building a new rec building uh, on Upper Elm Street by the uh, by the rec field up there. But right away, Cameron and Arnie, who were the first people we met with, uh, saw that the potential in instead uh, focusing on this property that's not in a floodplain that has plenty of parking, et cetera, uh, up on the hill. So um, I really want to thank Bill and Cameron and Arnie and Mike and others at City Hall that we've been meeting with pretty regularly over the past six months <laughs> since we first brought this. It was actually Cameron who first mentioned the possibility of a public-private partnership. And as Bill pointed out, nothing's in writing, nothing's firm. There's no formal commitments in either direction, but we are ready to move forward. And it's gonna significantly handicap us in terms of applying for grants 
getting bank loans, et cetera, et cetera, raising additional private capital. We, our goal is to raise uh, through private donations and then to leverage that to get bank loans and, and federal and state grants and private grants uh, to invest over $3 million on our piece of this partnership. So we're bringing significant private funds raised in t almost entirely from private citizens and local banks and local foundations uh, and so forth, and maybe a federal uh, agency or two that we might get a grant or two from. Um, so uh, we would really appreciate the council's uh, support as, as you see fit in enabling us to get out of this sort of holding pattern that we've been in for most of the last four months and move forward. Uh, we also have a commitment. I have a couple of uh, handouts to, that I'll pass out in a minute to the council members. One of them is um, a letter of interest, they call it, or a letter of intent from the Vermont Community Loan Fund for a loan of up to $400,000 specifically to retrofit the existing clubhouse up there on the land. Now, obviously this would be contingent on your buy-in, your approval and the city's approval. Uh, so we're not going ahead with a loan application until we have further discussions with all of you. Um, so that's our hope. We may be back here in a month making a formal proposal to the council. Uh, but for now, we're just uh, giving you an update on our progress and our hopes. Um, ideally, we would like to open for business uh, within a couple years. So that puts us probably a couple years ahead of the city's timetable in terms of uh, building a new rec center up there and rolling out the other recreational uh, amenities that would complement ours in this public nonprofit partnership that we've been talking about and envisioning for the last six months. Before that, we were talking to Steve Rebellini and his partners uh, in the same vein, but we're very supportive of working in the context of a partnership with the city, and we were very supportive of uh, the bond issue, and I like to think we had some influence in uh, lobbying our constituents to support that, uh, that bond. Okay. Yes. So are you looking at like one of those long term leases or are you of that land and up to so many acres around it? Is that ultimately what's your your end goal? Yeah, it's critical for us to be able to get large bank loans and uh, and or federal grants to have what they call site control. Mm -hmm. And since we're not going to own a piece of the property, the most likely way for us to achieve that would be if the city were willing to sign some sort of long-term lease. But in the short term, the, the, the closing with Steve Rebellini and his partners, as you probably know, is July 1st. Uh, so the city isn't going to be in a position to sign anything or negotiate much with us uh, before then. But we're hoping before then we could get some sort of indication, a memorandum of understanding or a letter of intent or something along those lines. Um, 
as to this is what we intend or envision. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else in the room who uh, has public comment? Yeah. Okay, Steve, since you're, you're right up to the mic, so you're up. Uh, I'm a bit uh, confused. It seems like we're in two different, it's a dystopian disconnect between what our city planner is asking for and some sense of an entitlement. Uh, I'm shocked uh, that the city manager and assistant city manager think they have the authority to commit to a lease uh, of a particular Thanks. piece of property before we've even started the design process. We may not want to have to design around a pre-existing, I don't think the title is transferring with a lease or an easement for a tennis club, you know? That may not be what we we all agree to a year from now or a year and a half from now. So I, the the entitlement just reeks here. Uh, so I think that we also I'm glad to hear that the closing won't happen until July. I think the city council would be remiss uh, in not getting an analysis of that intersection and whether or not that road up is going to take is going to be constrained by the railroad crossing and the grade. The intersection requirements to enter a state highway with a certain amount of traffic are very strict and complicated, and the railroad is not removable. I've heard that directly from the commission, the Secretary of Transportation. They need that, they will not forfeit that spur because they need to be able to park spare trains along it. So that could be a real defining factor, and we should know before we commit the money. Before the deal is signed, we should know whether, if it's going to add millions of dollars to the city's obligation, uh, maybe that's the price of, of uh, we have to sell a piece for a tennis club. But I just think we're, we're we should have known the viability of that access road. I know there was problems with it. I know the city knew there was problems with it. And we need due diligence requires we find out before the deal is signed and as to providing uh if, if we for instance a second city center or a a publicly owned rec center that may be first priority for the existing clubhouse we're not we're not we won't be ready to forfeit the rights to the clubhouse until a, a year a year and a half out according to mike i'm not I'd be happy if things move faster than that, but I trust his experience with this kind of thing. So I don't see how we can accommodate the desire of a, a private interest or group uh, with the with the process that's been laid out for a design. Um, I don't know what Poll Pro is, but if it's anything that requires internet access, it's going to discriminate a whole lot of old people and poor people who don't have broadband or don't have computers. So I just like to more clearly understand what somebody's going to rely on Poll Pro as the uh, um, have the appraisals been three appraisals been completed or two or three? The appraisal was completed. And has that amount been announced? Yes, it was 2.97 million. So it went from a million or a million and a half. It doubled. As soon as we went public with it, and the appraisal was started before the public uh, vote. Came out. And who selected the appraisers? Um, I remember. Okay, I'm I'm going to direct us away from this because we're the the item before us is planning for the uh, public process to uh, to develop this property, and uh, I just heard a whole wandering scheme about funding a tennis club. Well, you didn't hear that from the city. But you didn't shut him down. We'd just like to offer one okay. clarification to yet another misstatement that was just made. Um, the city manager and system manager have not committed to any lease at all, nor do we think we have the authority to do. What you heard me say was, I believe given the good faith conversations that have happened, that we owe clarity to the hub about whether they're going to have to wait a year and a half for everybody else or whether we would consider doing something different. Um, but I did not 
say one way or the other what I think we ought to do. I simply said, given the fact that we've had regular conversation with them, we owe them the courtesy of clarity. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Mr. Weiss. Hello, Thomas Hi. Weiss, resident of Montpelier. I have five comments on the presentation and the discussion to date. First is that I believe it was on Mr. Miller's first planning slide it lacks public participation in the development of the plan. It starts out with public gathering ideas, which has already happened, and then staff and a consultant do some things, and then the public is not involved again until after the plan has been developed. I suggest that you allow public participation with staff and with the consultant during the development of the plan so that all of a sudden at the end there's a plan that comes out and there's nobody on the public who knows what it's about and was involved in the development no matter how many updates and progress reports you give i think that public participation in that process is important second point uh, I think it was in the second stage mentioned some zoning changes. I really think you need to direct the Planning Commission to update the master plan before you contemplate any zoning changes for this area. The master plan is 12 years since it's been updated, and this will be a major change that was not considered in the master plan. So if the master plan, they're gonna be done with the zoning changes like tonight or at your next meeting, whenever you decide to accept them, that they then be directed to spend their time on updating the master plan. Third you, point- you, You've probably heard that that's happening right now. I haven't heard that's happening right now. Okay, well it is. I've got some more comments in the next part on that. Okay. Um, Mr. Miller said, don't rush. And I agree with him. I'm hearing, and my comment was first written in response to what he's asking you to do tonight, which is to combine, I think it was a, uh, a financial proposal and then going out to an RFP. I think it should be two steps. Develop the financial proposal. That is what it was, right, Mr. Miller? That, that's our intent, Mr. Weiss, okay. is to come back but, but to the it, council. But it wasn't worded that way, but I, I think there needs to be two separate steps. Get the financial proposal, see what it's involved, and then authorized going out with an RFP. Fourth point, I believe that uh, my counselor said that the Barry Street won't have a use for recreation if this gets built. And I would totally disagree with him on that because I think that for that portion of the public who would not drive out to this new recreation facility, that there need to be some downtown recreational facilities. Also in keeping with the city's uh, plans to uh, you know, foster downtown programs and services and net zero and, and those things. And the, oh, getting back to the don't rush, I believe that we should not be carving out any part of the parcel before the study and the plan gets done. We might or might not, if we carve something out, we might regret it when the, as the planning process goes forward. Last point, Polco. Who knows what their privacy policy is? Somebody we, signs in. Hmm? Yeah, they own that we don't have, it's not public record. And what do they do with it? What are they allowed to do with the data that they collect about each and every one of us who takes part in the I have whole. That. I'll get that information for you. I, I did okay, have a conversation. But, but to me, that's right. important because if they're selling the data, data brokers, whatever, or using it for purposes other than the poll, right. 
then I think that's something that we need to know about. So anyway, those are my five comments, a little long -winded, longer winded than I thought, but thank you for listening. Thank you. I don't see anyone else in the room. I see uh, John Snell online. Oh, and it looks like somebody needs to unmute you and okay you it looks like he's muted still john could you unmute yourself we're being told that it's on your end do you want me to try to unmute him yeah cameron station <laughs> Uh, sorry. Thank you. We can hear you. Good. Um, first off, I want to thank Mike for a really good overview presentation. It's great to start off with that kind of framework. John Snow. Thank you. Um, and among other things, I am chairman of the tree board and we've already done an informal visit up there and we're going to do some more visits up there, Connor. Uh, the trees are fabulous, I have to say. I, I have never seen trees quite that beautiful on a golf course before. Not that I'm an expert, but uh, I will say there's no green ash, which was a big plus. Um, the two, two other things that I think are, are important um, that whatever the planning process involves looking at the economic and traffic inputs to the surrounding areas and businesses uh, and property owners. Uh, and I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I think it's important to make sure that we at least talk about it, if not do a, a, a professional analysis. Um, second, I think that we, we really need to put effort into having some way to clearly communicate what is coming towards us in the way of planning, what decisions have been made, and then a historical record of that uh, that's accessible. I, I know that when I try and find out about city projects, it's just really difficult to find out where they started and where they're going. So I'd like to use this as an opportunity to beef that up. That's all for me, thank you. Okay, thanks, John. I don't see any other hands raised in the room or on uh, online. So are we ready to take uh, action? And the action requested right now is to direct the city to develop an RFP for well, a consultant. We, to, to come back to you with a funding, we would probably draft the RFP, but and come back with a funding plan and draft RFP and have you approve the funding and authorize us to go forward. Yeah, we should we should have a motion for that. So moved. <laughs> All right. You got that John, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I move that we. <laughs> I, I can try to say. It. It. I can okay. Go back to I move that we direct city staff to develop a financial proposal and draft RFP to present to council related to the former Elks Club property planning process. Is that, is that for the project manager, right? With this for the project for the manager. Planning process. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, that, that gives you and Mike what you need. Okay, any uh, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the uh, motion's carried. It's now 8.44 p.m. We're con completed with this item. It's, uh, we're a little bit past our uh, standard 8.30 break so we'll be taking a
10 minute break now and we will then go to the second public hearing on the uh, zoning proposal. I'm sorry, but we left the hub up in the air. I, I, they weren't oh. expecting something tonight. Okay, great. I don't think. Thank you. <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready to yeah, we're not in a position to give them any answers, right? So yeah. Okay. So we'll reconvene at eight at eight fifty-five. Okay, we're up to the uh, item on the uh, second public hearing on the uh, proposed zoning amendments. So, for starters, I will open the public hearing, and we have. Uh, Mike Miller uh, to make a presentation. Um, yeah, so again, Mike Miller, Director of Planning. So we're not going to, um, unless somebody objects and would like me to go through the, the presentation for brevity's sake, um, I'm not gonna go through the presentation of the 11 sets of changes. Uh, anyone who missed the last meeting, uh, just to catch you up, there were uh, votes to remove number eight, which was the uh, remove residential densities. So that is no longer under consideration. And inside of number nine, the solar access proposal was also struck. So those two changes, uh, for anyone who missed the last meeting, those two changes have happened. Um, so I did want to um, talk about two quick comments, um, one of which is to address a comment that was made at the last public hearing, which was about the zoning changes in conformance with the city master plan. So this is a legal requirement that um, all zoning must be in conformance with the adopted master plan. And there is a definition of this under the state. Um, there's a, a memo that was provided to the council and is in, in the packet, and I won't read through all three or four pages of, of the description, but what's important is that conformance with the plan means a proposed amendment, a proposed implementation tool, including a bylaw or bylaw amendment that isn't in accord with the municipal plan in effect at the time of adoption when the bylaw or bylaw amendment includes all of the following. So this is the definition under state law. So it means that the bylaw or bylaw amendment makes progress towards attaining or at least does not interfere with the goals and policies contained in the municipal plan. B, it provides for proposed future land uses, densities, and intensities of development contained in the municipal plan. And C, carries out as applicable any specific proposals for community facilities or other proposed actions contained in the municipal plan. So this comes up uh, from time to time as we talk about amendments to city plans. And um, I believe the current proposal is in conformance with the city master plan as it was adopted in 2017. But ultimately that determination is really up to city council um, through your adoption or your decisions. Um, and so the first uh, thing I wanted to point out is that municipal plans cover a broad range of topics and inherent in that, um, the fact that we are covering everything from natural resources and housing and energy and historic preservation and transportation, economic development. Some of these goals are inherently going to conflict with other goals. Economic development may conflict with our natural resource goals. So we have a balancing that has to happen. Um, and so municipal plans don't answer how we balance all of these conflicting interests. And that balancing happens um, as we go through and do the adoption of our implementation tools or doing our projects. Um, so if you look at that first definition above, um, it states that conformance means the implementation tool must make progress towards attaining or at least not interfering with the goals uh, of the plan contained in the municipal plan. And a strict reading of that would lead you to believe that if a zoning regulation furthers 99 out of 100 goals, that it would not be in conformance because it interferes with one. Um, and that's simply not the case. That's not how how um, these things are evaluated. And the way they're evaluated um, under law is through a two step process. And the first step is, does the proposal advance a specific policy or goal outlined in the plan? And if it does, that action, the zoning proposal is in conformance. The fact that it may hinder another goal while meeting the first does not negate the conformance. So that second piece of that phrase comes into effect if 
what you're proposing is not talked about at all in the city plan. So if you have an item that's being proposed in the in the um, in the proposed zoning that's not talked about in the city plan, then we would check to see if it negatively impacts one of the stated goals. And if it doesn't support or negate, then it's in conformance. But if it impacts one, then it would be not in conformance. So it's a two step process. Um, so that's one of the key pieces. That's why I believe because I, I did outline a number of goals in here that I believe these proposals support. So I believe that um, based on that two step analysis that what we have been proposing is in conformance with the, the master plan. Um, there is a, a second a uh, second piece that is referred to um, about matching the um, the future land use plans. Um, just trying to find my note on that one. Um, So there, the, the second goal was looking at, oh, there it is. Uh, going back to the conformance with the plan, there is a second requirement to provide the proposed future land uses and densities. Um, and again, this is a lower threshold. We're talking about providing for the densities. And this um, subsection, um, the zoning bylaws do just that. The densities in our zoning prescribe much higher densities in our growth center and smart growth centers around those neighborhoods. Um, and just to be clear, the growth center is a, uh, it's a state program and the, it is provided by the downtown board. And the purpose of it is to direct 50% of development towards the growth center over the 20 years that it's in effect. And we have so far been about 80 or 90% of our development within our growth center. We've been highly successful at meeting that target. Um, it doesn't say you can't develop outside and it doesn't say you shouldn't try to be developing outside. Um, it simply says this is the goal that we're trying to attain is reaching that 50% goal. So again, I believe um, examining both of these pieces that um, in, in this case, it was directed at the Northfield Street proposal. And I think in both cases, the Northfield Street proposal is in conformance with the city master plan of 2017. So um, uh, I'll leave that for any more questions on conformance with the master plan. The second piece I just wanted to touch on was the piece that was eliminated, the solar access and shading. And while I understand we're not going to be bringing this back up, um, I did outline in my memo a number of issues why this was um, a problem, why we felt in the Planning Commission and the Planning Department that it was a problem. And while we recognized that the proposed solution was not acceptable by the Council, that's fine. Um, but we do feel some direction to the Planning Commission would be helpful. Um, and I outlined six different ways that we could look at adjusting how we regulate shading because because of the terms, any shading of any walls, yards, or roofs that exceed the formula will result of a denial of an infill, of an infill project. There is no waiver, no variance. <coughs> yards could be unbuildable due to steep slopes or completely shaded already by trees or by the terrain could also completely shade it. Um, and it applies even if it only makes a shadow for one week onto that yard in the middle of December. Um, it would there's no no way we can not not deny the application so it's it's an extremely strict rule and we just think that it's it's overly burdensome on applicants and will have a negative impact resulting in shorter buildings building set back farther from property lines um, so i listed some things for you to consider you don't have to make any decisions tonight but it's something at the planning commission if the planning commission is going to take this up and bring a new proposal to you they would appreciate at some point having some ideas um, based on uh, the six or seven bullets that i put in there or any other idea if people have other ideas for how you might like to consider it so those were the two points i wanted to make to, to keep this short i know we have a long agenda um, and turn it back over to chair thanks mike before you uh wrap up the uh a point I made earlier, could you talk a little bit about where things stand with the uh, current master plan development process? 
Uh, so the city, uh, the planning department has been working for a number of years with the various committees. So our plan for updating the city plan um, started in 2017. And our approach was that we wanted to make a much more strategic plan and a much um, um, more targeted plan for how we can accomplish our goals. So we've been working with individual committees over the past four years. And we have um, gone through about 80% of the plan so far. We've got uh, community services and public service, uh, public safety that are left to do. Um, and we have an RFP that went out and we have one response, which we're reviewing right now, which is going to be for a company to help us develop the web-based city plan. Um, we wanna have a digital plan. Uh, people don't tend to read um, hard copy plans. They're obviously probably be a hard copy plan for people who want it, but most people access plans now through, through the internet. And so we're gonna to try to build a much more responsive uh, plan. And so we have an RFP, we have um, proposals to look at. And so we're gonna be hiring somebody and, and there should be a lot of building out of that plan this year with more public input um, on those chapters coming in hopefully later this summer. Great, thanks. Um, this is a public hearing, so I want to start by asking if there are any members of the public who want to be uh, to be heard on any of the issues arising from the uh, zoning proposal that we've heard uh, last time and uh, tonight. And Thomas Weiss and uh, and Patty. Uh, Okay, why don't you step up and identify Thank you, yourself. Thank you, Patty Comline. It's my first time here. Donna doesn't remember, but about 20 years ago, she taught me a public speaking class in, uh, in Manchester, Vermont. So funny to see you. So I am from, a, uh, from a, across the river, a small neighborhood we call Upper Donut, given its proximity to Dunkin' Donuts. So I live up there, and I'm here to talk about the North, Northfield Project. Um, a number of months ago, we were given a tour of that project, a few of our neighbors, and it raised more concerns than it did answer questions. And so a petition was submitted um, to the Planning Commission. Unfortunately, those questions were left largely unaddressed. So more people have added their names to that petition, which I have here. So I'm here representing 30 of our neighbors. Um, some of the questions we have, and I'm going to be brief, I'll stay within six minutes. Notice that was the key time. Uh, should the zoning be changed to benefit only one landowner? Should the zoning be changed if the greater density denudes the wooded hillsides around Montpelier? This is a prominent ridgeline as seen from downtown. I do have, picture, I do have pictures here. Um, I don't know if you could take that and pass it, thank you. It shows the ridge top. It also shows the second page. You'll see a green area, which is the proposed development, which is indeed the top of that ridge line. Another question, should zoning be changed before it is known whether the road infrastructure can support denser uh, residential development? During our tour, uh, we were told that one area considered for access to this area, to this development, uh, would be pr the end of um, Pleasant Street, which is actually my house and a cliff. So I knew that couldn't be so. The other side is Cherry Street, which is equally problematic. Well, not equally because it's not a cliff. But when you're driving down there, and I have pictures of this, if you could pass that. Um, it's very tight. When we're passing our neighbors, we have to pull into a neighbor's driveway. It's a nice way to wave to your neighbor. Not so nice when it's icy and you're heading down the Luge Hill and you're trying not to slide into each other, but it's a pretty tight access. I believe it's possible there is another access um, through Northfield Street that may not be better. I don't know. That wasn't really discussed during our tour, but it's something that would be considered. My last question would be, I had more questions, but given the night, I'd be grateful that I crossed those out. Should the zoning be changed if the greater density threatens the neighbors with stormwater runoff issues? This is a great concern to us because the change is from proposed, what is allowed there now are 27 units. The change would allow up to 270 units. And it's very steep up behind our houses. Uh, the soil base is very shallow. Uh, my neighbor, when I walk by their house every day, I hear this flushing sound. Well, I've lived there for four years, and I only just recently learned that it's actually a pump to their basement. I just thought they had a really loud toilet. But that goes all the time. It's flushing out. So it, fortunately, our house is dry, but there is some water that runs through there. And the idea of, of 270 
um, units up there is a concern. We even have stone walls that are starting to give way. So there is there's serious concern anyway without all of this. So those are some of the questions. I know VHCB has provided funding for a feasibility study that's in process that hasn't been completed yet. Um, we heard about the ELS Club project. Um, I know that there's a consideration of a BOVE project. That's all in the same vicinity. So I would ask you all to take a holistic approach to the development of all of this and what impacts those would have, um, the environmental impacts, the traffic impacts. Uh, we're, just, we're just really concerned that Planning Commission hasn't answered these questions. Um, so we would ask you to wait for that feasibility study to get our answers from the Planning Commission. Um, I know this is late in the process. Um, my only experience my only experience is with the legislature. I consider this like third reading. Things do happen in third reading, even though people are kind of checked out and ready for things to go, but it's meant to be a deliberative process. And I know that you all want to make a comprehensive decision armed with all of the facts. And I would ask you to get those that information from the Planning Commission and wait for that study. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks for coming. Okay, Tom Weiss. Hello again. Uh, I forgot to mention the first time, thank you for removing the solar access proposed provision last time. Um, I'm also a civil engineer and Ms. Kamwine mentioned what I intend to talk about. Let's step back a minute and consider why there are no houses on the majority of this parcel. The USDA, uh, Department of Agriculture, has a Natural Resources Conservation Service, and they map the soils over the whole country. And this, each soil type or complex is rated for suitability for various uses. The soil map at 102 Northfield Street is soil type, what they number as 66E. And the E after the number designates the steepest slope that the Natural Resources Conservation Service assigns to soil map units. The soils, the slopes in that map unit are 25% to 60%. Uh, and these slopes, the NRCS calls to be steep or very steep. And because of the steepness of this map unit, there's a severe erosion hazard. And the slope also has, of course, severe limitations on use as a building site. And the crest of the ridge through the central portion of the site or the parcel is the least steep portion, and it's considered to be strongly sloping. This portion consists of the summit and shoulders of the ridge. So as you're coming down the ridge, the summit would be this part, and then the shoulders would be these parts just as it's starting to slope off off the summit and this the and the bedrock in these summit and shoulder areas is shallow one to three feet below the surface typically and the bedrock according to the vermont geological surveys bedrock map of the state is metamorphic phyllites slates and quartzites those are very hard rocks, and it means that a large amount of blasting likely will happen in these less steep areas of the ridge. Uh, so in short, the slope and the bedrock make the site difficult and expensive to develop. I suggest that's a major reason why the majority of this parcel has not been developed yet. So based on the soils maps and the geology maps, it's unlikely that this area can be reasonably developed, and I request the council reject this proposed amendment. I'd like to step back a bit, back to 9 Heaton Street and 10 Heaton Street. I talked to you about this last week. I'm not going to repeat anything I said. I trust that you remember it, and you didn't take it out last week, or three weeks ago after last meeting. But it's not clear to me whether the contemplation is to put apartments or congregate housing into the existing building. I've heard both. I didn't think to call the property owner soon enough to get an answer as to what they are contemplating. But if congregate housing is what is contemplated, and the jargon congregate housing is 
might be shared kitchens, it might be shared toilet facilities, it might be shared some other facilities that would normally be found in a complete housing unit. Um, so if that's what is contemplated, then nine residences may be built on the site in addition to the congregate housing in the existing building. So um, I, I don't know whether any of you know which has actually been contemplated, and I use the word contemplated because I don't think it's far enough advanced to be a proposal or, or anything else. Um, so if, if it is congregate housing that's contemplated, then there's no need for this zoning amendment, as I understand it would be then the housing in the building plus five or six additional housing units when they could get nine on there. So I know I'm running out of time. Um, also, uh, back to 102 Northfield Street, the master plan identifies this area as a biodiversity conservation area, a rich northern hardwood forest, and a hemlock northern hardwood forest. And the master plan sets goals relating to biodiversity conservation areas. And the recommendations, the recommended strategy for this calls for the Conservation Commission, the Planning Commission, and the City Council to establish planning policies and bylaws that promote biodiversity conservation. And if the Planning Commission had done that sometime in the last 12 years that they've had to available to them to update the master plan, it seems we wouldn't be floundering around now trying to figure out how to deal with a biodiversity conservation area on this parcel as well as everything else we're trying to deal with which leads me into my next topic um, on master planning updates and what i was about to say is totally revamped so it's much much shorter um, i suggest you put these zoning amendments on hold until the master plan is re revised and i also suggest that you as the city council follow through on the required monitoring and evaluation of progress toward the goals in the master plan, which requires the city to convene the stakeholders from the envision process annually to take stock of the progress that has been made and, this, and recommendations for changes to the master plan. And the critical part is the results of this annual meeting should have been reported to the voters in the city's annual report every year. And I didn't find anything like that in this annual report. All I found was a little mention in uh, the planning department's part that we started doing this in 2017 and we expect something out in 2022. Uh, but that's definitely not the type of analysis that I would expect based on what the master plan calls for. So anyway, thank you for taking the time to hear my comments. Thanks for coming in. Um, I don't see anyone else in the room with their hands up. There are a few people online, starting with uh, Eve Mendelson. Yeah, hi, it's Eve Mendelson, and I'm over on Fuller Street, which backs up to Heaton Woods. Um, and I'm talking about your number two. I'm gonna just read a little bit from the Unified Development Regulations from October 2019, just to clear, because I think it clarifies my thoughts more than I probably can. Um, so for the Res 6000 and Res 3000, the purpose of this district is to encourage infill development and a range of housing choices while preserving neighborhood character and quality. Uh, for the College Hill North, um, proposed land development should protect the historic character and appeal of this neighborhood while accommodating modest increases in density through compatible infill development and conservation and conversion of existing buildings to multifamily occupancy. So, um, Heaton Street is a very small street. It's maybe a quarter mile if you met, include parts of Woodrow. And uh, the usage of the existing Washington County Mental Health Building, which actually used to be a nursing facility and people did live there, and uh, would be great. But adding five townhouses um, and five townhouses built to Res 3000 with the parcel sizes and setbacks and density are not exactly preserving the neighborhood. And I know we're the idea is to build a different neighborhood, but literally, if you walk by Heaton Woods for 400 feet, you're you're going from College Street North, five 400 feet of these new neighborhood, and then back into College Street North. I don't. It seems 
a little bit of a, of a, a spot zoning in, in some ways, but I know um, the zoning feel like strongly that this is a different zone, but, but to me, you can't, you can't, there's no demarcation. There's no ingress or egress. The roads that are there are, are Heaton Street and, and Woodrow. And so looking at Heaton Street, there are 39 beds apparently at Heaton Woods and four houses, let's say on Heaton Street, that's about 43 units. So with the request from Washington County Mental Health to add 23 units, 18 inside and five outside, that's a 50% increase. I don't, I don't know about modest increases, but I think if at Res 6,000 from my helpful discussions with Mike Miller today, it seems like it would be about half or even maybe a little less but that to me seems like a modest increase while still using uh, some, some of the inside building and perhaps some townhouses, but built to, to match what really is the same neighborhood, which is College Street North and not a separate neighborhood. Um, so I'm not opposed to having these housing, but I think it should still meet the Res 6000 uh, as it is set up now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Brenda Hausauer. Thanks. Uh, my name is Brenda Hausauer. I live on 20 Pleasant Street. And um, I just want to build on a couple of the other comments that have already been said about the, um, the rezoning of the property off of Northfield Street. Um, I just wanted to paint a picture for you of a, a few of the basic attributes of this property. So the property is 57 acres, so it's pretty large. That's about um, twice the size of the North Branch Nature Center land, so it's a pretty big piece. Um, it's completely forested at this point, so um, as you would expect, there's a lot of wildlife back there. Um, the property is contiguous to a lot of forest land and farmland to the south, so um, you know the wildlife has a, a big corridor there to roam through. Um, and it's located very close to the downtown and it forms one of the wooded hillsides and ridgelines that surround Montpelier. Um, so I want to try to show a, a picture. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, but I hope you can like kind of make it out here. Um, maybe if I tip my screen. Okay. So this, this picture is taken from Cliff Street. Um, it's looking south. And you can see the sort of V in the hillsides, and that's where Northfield Street is. Um, and you can see the, uh, the hillside to the right is undeveloped. And then you can see the hillside to the left is has some uh, housing about halfway up, and that is Pleasant Street. Um, and the houses below it are Cherry Street. And so the, the parcel we're talking about rezoning is above Pleasant Street houses and to the left of the, the houses. So um, if this property is rezoned, we're likely to see housing on that ridge line as well as to the left of that of the Pleasant Street houses, um, which will really um, which will really, you know, result in the loss of much of that wooded hillside. Um, so, you know, this hillside is one of the backdrops of, of wooded hillside and ridgeline that surround Montpelier. Uh, we don't have another residential development on a ridgeline like this that's so close to the downtown and so easily visible. Um, any development that would happen there would obviously be very visible. Um, and it is one of the goals of the master plan to preserve these wooded hill signs and ridge lines around Montpelier. Um, so, you know, to me, so what will we lose if we develop this property? We'll lose a lot of trees. Um, you know, we'll be logging and exposing most of that hillside. Um, we'll lose a lot of acres of wildlife habitat. And we'll lose kind of our typical view of being able to stand in the middle of Montpelier and look around and see us mostly surrounded by wooded hillsides and ridgelines. Um, so I just want to kind of invite everybody to walk around Montpelier and look at that hillside from different vantage points. You can see it really well from the Shaw's parking lot, from 
state and Maine from um, the Transportation Center, lots of other locations, and to just really reflect on whether we want to see that whole hillside covered with residential development. Um, you know, I really support uh, affordable housing, more affordable housing in Montpelier, but I think that we would just lose too much by developing that um, that hillside and ridgeline, and especially when there are other locations around Montpelier that can support residential development without some of those issues. Um, and finally, I just think that uh, developing the hillside will ultimately be unpopular with a lot of residents of Montpelier. So thanks a lot. Thank you. And I would have to say that your tactic, technique of, you, of holding your phone up to the camera actually worked pretty well to enable oh, us to what we we're uh, looking at uh, surprisingly great. well. Thank you. Sure, uh, sure. Next up, Kirby Keaton. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kirby Keaton. I'm the uh, chair of the Planning Commission, so I thought I should respond to some things because um, this is the first time I think Northfield Street's uh, come out as um, as an issue. So there was there was a comment from Patty that um, there wasn't a lot of response from the Planning Commission. But as you know, in, in hearings, we don't do a back and forth, just like the City Council doesn't tend to do a back and forth. So um, that's why there wasn't a lot of Planning Commission feedback. Um, during the hearing, because you know, you know how these things go. Um, but now's the time, so I'll, I'll give you some of our reasoning and, and what came up in our deliberations about this. Um, for one thing, I want to be really clear that what we decided and what we're suggesting for Northfield Street project, um, it was not about one parcel. It was not about a project. It was not about an owner. It was about uh, looking at the city plan and the zoning map as it is and looking at what's appropriate now that this neighborhood and area has been called to our attention and for us to review further. And in doing that, we realized a lot of things that hadn't been noticed before when we were doing the zoning ordinance. Um, little background, the reason why that this project is, uh, or, or why this area, this, this neighborhood area is zoned the way it is is because uh, there's not a lot of development around there. And when we redid the zoning years ago, we based um, the zoning around the current development. And at that time, we were not looking at prospective development. We weren't doing a whole lot of planning for future land use, to be honest. We set everything at 90% of conformance for the current uh, neighborhood and kind of put everything up to a status quo. And that was actually progress at the time because our zoning was way behind what our neighborhoods actually look like. Our zoning was much more restrictive. And, and so 90% so compliance means that there's still 10% in each neighborhood of, of parcels that don't conform. My point is that we haven't done a lot of perspective analysis of, well, where are the best places for future growth where we need to, to look and expand on what we're allowing? And this is an undeveloped area. So it's, it's, it's zoned as a very low density, low development place because that's what it's currently like. But it has the features of exactly what we want as a city, I believe, and what maybe more importantly, the city plan wants in housing development. It, it's walkable to downtown, which is incredibly important for our city plan. It's close to public transportation. Um, and it's it's a prime area for what we want to see for a development. Um, as far as any other alternatives for a project like this within our city, geographically we are we're tiny. There's not a lot of opportunities for um, any big new projects that that actually meets the criteria of being walkable to our downtown. And, and contributing to that. So, so that was a big part of this. We realized that this is a very unutilized area as far as the development that we want and need from our city plan. Um, so, so we reassessed it. Um, I, I wanna reiterate that the, the, the city plan absolutely is in line with, with making this adjustment. And as Mike mentioned earlier, um, Maybe there are some other things that you could find that could conflict, but that's not what matters. As long as we're doing something that part of the city plan wants to do, then that's the barrier, that's the standard. So, so in my mind, there's no conflict whatsoever. And, and, it, and it by and large, it goes far for what our city plan says for housing goals. 
As for what was said about the engineering things, the, the, the blasting and engineering concerns, I mean, in my mind, I think that's speculative. Um, it's not something we have to worry about because whatever gets built there um, will have to follow uh, all of our rules about slopes, all of our rules about, uh, you know, how things are supposed to be built. So that's not really our concern. It's the concern of whatever developer comes in and, and has a project. And, and that is our attitude. This, the planning commission's attitude was like, it's whatever developer. We're not, we're not thinking about this in terms of one project. We know that there's a project out there, um, but that's, that's not what's leading our thinking. Uh, another thing I will add as an aside is that maybe, maybe you are or aren't aware, but that side of the river is in dire need of some parks. It, um, that, that area needs parks compared with the rest of the city. Um, it's something the Planning Commission is aware of. In, in our rewrite of the new city plan, we are hoping to call for more parks over there. It just so happens, and this isn't a big part of our decision, but um, the project that's being proposed involves a lot of open space and public access. So uh, as, far as, as far as this project goes, it actually meets a, a, a sub-goal we have. Um, but even aside from that, I mean, we, we need residential development that that's, that's that close to downtown. And then when it comes to the views, if that photo that we just saw came from Cliff Street. Well, Cliff Street's developed and it's right over our downtown. This is another ridge that's right over our downtown. That's, that's maybe a little farther than Cliff Street, but it's still walkable. So it absolutely fits within the current development and what, and what the city looks like. Um, I could also talk about the um, the solar shading issue now if if people are interested. Um, should I go ahead and do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> so my understanding was uh, we haven't heard any comments about solar shading tonight. But my understanding was that you know solar shading was set aside in the last meeting, but it was going to be reconsidered tonight. So I sent you a, a letter explaining some of the reasoning of the planning commission for what we were advising before. So I'm just going to hit just a few quick highlights about that. Um, the shading, shading issues and, and, and problems with solar access in Montpelier right now have almost everything to do with trees and terrain. Um, buildings aren't a big obstacle. And, and this regulation, though, goes to, goes to just the buildings and preventing new development um, from stopping hypothetical future uh, um, solar projects. And we don't see that as a big issue that's happening, but we do see that the way that the regulation is currently written is so strict that it's, it's almost definitely going to stop development and, and a lot of needed infill development for housing. Uh, but we're not sure it's actually going to achieve anything for solar. And we actually think that it might defeat itself in a lot of ways, because if we stop new construction of, of taller things that might create a shadow, then we're stopping the construction of buildings that you could put solar panels on top of because that's the best place to put solar panels because that gets above the shading issue with the trees and like and really the trees is the big is the big issue that we have and that we see so um i would i would like you to consider uh rephrasing the right re the requirement as we've suggested which is a pretty simple fix i like that it's simple that it's short because that makes it easier for the public to follow and to comply with um, if we don't take that approach, if you do want something that's not as um, lenient, I guess you could say, is what we're asking, then Mike's put forward many great suggestions for how to kind of sure up this requirement and not make it so strict and likely to prevent development. Um, it, I think it will be more complicated that way, but it at least will be better in that it's not going to absolutely preclude development like it's currently stated. And just as a bit of a background, by the way, we redid the zoning a few years ago, as you know, this um, requirement was added when we did that. Um, when, when, we went to read, when we went to redo all of the zoning for the entire city, that was a huge project and we worked really hard for that, um, but we did not give a thorough analysis to every single part of everything there. We just didn't have the time. You know, we don't, we don't meet, we're not full time doing this, right? This was not something that I think that we looked at very carefully. I don't think we ever intended for it to be as strict as it as on the ground as it turned out being. Um, and that's one reason why we're we're 
like the entire planning commission would, would like to just take this one back a whole lot because we didn't we didn't mean for something that's going to uh, be you know so so strict and 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 opposing to uh, to zoning and new development. Um, and I'll stop with I'll stop with that because I think that's um, I don't think there's any other issues you need to hear from me about. Great, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, next up, we have Zach Watson. Thank you, Zach Watson, Montpelier. Um, Kirby really just summed up um, everything more succinctly than I possibly could have. I just want to say I, I appreciate the discussion that's going on tonight and um, and want folks to know that if it is the city's council will to, to approve this rezoning change that we will continue to have a, a robust public engagement process that is required by the funds that we'll be using for our feasibility study. Um, and I, I hope the folks know that that is a, a not just a, something we're saying that it's something we're committed to as we've already we've actually already hosted three public meetings about this. Uh, we are really committed to making sure that um, we're hearing from our neighbors and we're and that whatever we build on this parcel of rezoning is approved um, fits within uh, the desires and of our neighbors. So, um, really encourage you to continue to be part of the process if this moves forward um, to make sure that it's the best project possible. I also just want to just want to say again, and I said this last meeting as well. Um, we are not looking at going up Pleasant Street or Cherry Street. That is not an option. And Patty knows uh, when we walk the property, the only part um, access we talked about was coming off Northfield Street. And I think I might have explicitly said it was definitely not coming off of. Pleasant Street or Cherry Street. So, um, but thank you again for considering this uh, this rezoning request, and um, and I invite everybody to be a part of the process if this goes forward. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. I have a question because the uh, this feasibility study has come up a couple of times. Are are you in one of these chicken and egg things where if the zoning change isn't approved? it's not going to be worth spending the money on the feasibility study so that's not happening until we know what's happening with the zoning that's that's correct um uh, you know we it's it's tough to really say <laughs> what we can do and what's feasible uh up there uh, before we have a feasibility study um it's a tricky parcel it's very very tricky and um access is the number one issue um, but stormwater mitigation is another big piece, and um, ultimately, you know, uh, optimistically, we the project could go forward if if we could build maybe 50 units up there, and that we'd have to get pretty creative to to make that happen with the current zoning. Um, so really, for this even a feasibility study to make sense, um, there needs to be higher density. Um, but I will also say that. Uh, and I know I've talked to other folks about this, um, and Kirby had mentioned it, this parcel is a great parcel for residential development for Montpelier for a lot of the reasons that were mentioned. Um, and regardless if it's our project or, or somebody else, uh, this should be, this, this parcels like this should be um, given rezoning options to allow for them to have higher density to make the probability of creating uh, housing closer to, to the downtown more likely. So, um, so I hope that answers your question, Jack. It, it does. Thank you. Um, I don't see any. Oh, Steve, you have your hand up now. Uh, Steve Whitaker, uh, the more I hear uh, about the, I'm hearing there's a five-year outdated master plan and there's a 12-year outdated master plan. Um, and that these zoning changes are only to be done in coordinates with what would presumably be a current updated master plan and if we're in the process of updating master plan that should be the completed before these voting zoning changes it, it this one reeks uh i mean the visual impact on the town of building on our you know a rocky steep hillside uh in the absence of a completed master plan and zoning then a zoning proposal following a completed master plan reeks of, of uh, preferential treatment to the mayor's husband. And, you know, 
if even habitat, if habitat is tailored to low income housing, low income housing should be infill in the meadow or infill in the areas that are walkable. Walking up Northfield Street is not easy for people, especially handicapped people. It's so it's not the right site for building possibly anything. And it seems like we're trying to force it in because of the desperation for affordable housing. But in the absence of our master plan being completed to make sure that that's a proper place to be rezoning, I would say table that one. Thank you. Um, Patty, someone else is, who's not spoken yet has, uh, has a hand up, so I'm gonna ask, have them first. Um, Dana, online. Hi there. I'm Dana. Um, I'm a resident of Colonial Drive, District 3, and I guess I just felt the need to speak to the equity issue. Um, I do feel that those of us that live on the south side of Route 2, we don't have a park. We don't have amenities. It's not really a focus of the town to think about creating outdoor spaces or uh, spots for our residents to recreate. And this is a spot that historically has been utilized by those of us that live in this district. And um, I just would like that to be considered. I can't speak to all the technicalities of the zoning and the water runoff, et cetera, but as a resident here, um, I don't feel like that we always get the attention to prioritize these types of spots. And this is something that I feel like is, should be considered in thinking about, is this the best spot for the town to prioritize other housing needs when there are other opportunities that could be utilized? Okay, thank you. Now, can I get your last name, Dana? Paul, two L's. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks. So Patty, uh, if you have a very brief statement. Very brief. I would just like to say to Zach Watson's points about talking about access points, the most definitely discussed with us, the Pleasant Street and the Cherry Street access points. Also, the, the photograph that was mentioned that was taken from Cliff Street, that's a developed area. I don't believe Cliff Street has 270 units up there. So that's where our concerns are. And could I just ask a question if, and I don't believe the HCB um, funding for the feasibility study is contingent on the rezoning, but if, um, if the feasibility, if you rezone and the feasibility study shows that it's not a viable project, does that mean that this out of state, one person out of state developer can do whatever he wants on that property or with with regard to 270 units and, and whatever way he wants? I I will be asking the planning director a question about uh, okay. Thank you. About uh, related to that. Yes. Nasir uh, Montpelier. Uh, listening in on this, I just want to say that uh, I understand the housing issue and the affordable housing issue totally. But I also have great sadness about seeing every parcel of land covered with buildings. You know, we, we need nature. And also anything that's built, I hope it's uh, really far up to energy standards extreme because otherwise it shouldn't be built you know we're we're struggling with the environment so that's just my two cents thank you um yes ward i'm going to be a little polemical here and say that i actually would like to see more traffic more housing and I think we have responsibility to develop properties like this. And I'm sorry to say as much as I love Montpelier's rural sort of urban mix, the fact is, is it's a downtown. And so we have to pump up the downtowns. And I strongly support um, infill on properties where it's appropriate. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Tom Weiss, again, very quickly, if you could. 
Yes, Thomas Weiss again, very quickly. Uh, in response to Mr. Keaton's discussion on solar access, I sat in on the last year of the Planning Commission's every meeting when they were developing that zoning regulation that I think it's, well, it's not quite the one we now have because it's been amended a few times since then. And I do remember, because I was involved with it, the solar access discussions occurring over multiple meetings uh, in that period and went through multiple variations and ended up with the variation that is in the zoning now. So it was heavily discussed back then, and that is what the Planning Commission decided on is the way I remember it. Uh, as I said, I mentioned last time that solar access was my thesis, uh, my study in graduate school. And so I, I was quite involved with, with helping to shape that and the commission left it the way it is after what I thought was a thorough discussion over several meetings. Okay, thanks. Um, Peter Kelman online. Uh, Peter Kelman, uh, I live in Mountain View Street. So I live in the Northfield uh, uh, Avenue area. I'm very much in favor of this project um, for a number of reasons. First of all, the obvious one that we need much more housing and much more affordable housing in our city. And we need to have more uh, densely developed ne uh, areas near the uh, downtown. But also ironically, Dana, if you're still there, um, that area, uh, if it's developed by Habitat in any case, will have a great deal of parkland for our side of the river. Precisely, um, uh, right now it's privately owned, and yes, people have colonized it with bike trails for themselves and their next door neighbors, but this would be for the whole area. I think it's a terrific project, and I uh, urge the, the zoning be changed, not just because of habitat and certainly not because of any impropriety having to do with the fact that Zach Watson and Ann Watson have to be married. It has nothing to do with that. Um, but whether it was habitat or not, but I think habitat is the right developer, but habitat or not, this land should be developed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike, I had a question for you because uh, we heard a figure of potentially 267 units on the lot, uh, the runoff and that kind of thing. And so I just think, is that no matter what's theoretically permissible, is it a practical reality that someone could develop 267 units on that uh, parcel? And are the runoff and steep slopes and other regulations in our zoning bylaw still there to protect uh, the neighbors from uh, from the stormwater and the other problems that we've been, been hearing about? Yes, yeah, so there's, so there are a, num a number of related points. So um, all of those requirements still exist. So the 270 units would be really possible only if that were a flat open lot, you know, which we obviously don't have very many of, and, and certainly no 57 acre properties that are that big, that would be flat and open. So the reality is it's not going to be able to accommodate that amount of, of development simply because it has so many steep slopes and so much um, shallow soils. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure I clarified one point on the reason why we considered rezoning this, it was zoned rural. And the reason why it was zoned rural is because it didn't have access to sewer and water. So this property doesn't have sewer and water. That's why it's zoned rural. Rural is a two acre zoning because generally you need at least two acres to drill your own well and put your own onsite septic. So that's why it's zoned for two acres. When Zach approached the city, he said, I would like to extend sewer and water into this. Now we have other properties in the city where we have rezoned. Crestview is one of them. It's an interior parcel, but it has access to sewer and water. So it's zoned at residential 9,000. Residential 9,000 is the kind of the, the, the target number that is used. If you have access to sewer and water, you wanna have about four units per acre because you need about four units per acre 
to generate enough wastewater to generate enough fees in order to pay for the long term maintenance of the line. So if you extend sewer lines into an area that has one acre zoning, the users of that will never pay enough in fees to maintain their own lines that will have to be subsidized by the higher density areas. So usually what you're recommended to best practice is if you're going to extend sewer and water, you should have at least four units an acre or in this case residential 9000. So the reason for the change is strictly due to the fact that they have said they are looking at a proposal where they're going to extend sewer and water into this area. And so that's why we've basically why we're considering the residential 9000. Now, my understanding of the proposal, and these will all be reviewed at the zoning level when the permits are applied for, but they're looking at finding 15 acres of the 54 acres that they find that might be buildable. So they're, they're not looking at, at denuding the 57 acres, but again, that would all be regulated when the uh, permits come up. In 30% slopes, there is very serious engineering and design requirements for 30% slopes, of which this property has a lot of. So um, I can't speak to exactly how everything would play out um, with, with an application if Habitat didn't do the project and a private developer came in. Um, again, they could only take care of, take advantage of those densities if they run sewer and water. And because of the cost of sewer and water, think of it costs $2 million to run the sewer and water in, and you build one house that costs $500,000. You'd have to sell that $500,000 house for $2.5 million to get your money back. So what you need to do if you're going to spend that much amount of money for bringing in sewer and water and roads, everything else, you need a number of units so that way you can lower the per unit costs to pay for all of your utilities. And that's a lot of why he says, Zach says he needs about 50 units is basically looking at those, the, the math. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't do him any good to spread those houses out. That's more cost for more roads and more cost for more sewer and water and more costs for stormwater runoff. His best interest is to concentrate it, um, which is my understanding what any proposal would do in that area. So um, really the basis of, you know, roundabout way, the basis of a lot of this zoning change comes down to the fact that they're proposing to extend sewer and water. And if they're going to do that, we should consider it a res 9,000. Thank you very much. Do, are there any other questions or comments from other members of the council? Yeah, I would just say I really hope the habitat project is successful. To me, it's you know kind of a perfect marriage of green space and affordable housing. And uh, you know, it might be bad policy on my part that I really am envisioning the habitat property going through and taking this space. Um, so I. Hope the feasibility study is okay. Yeah. yeah. A bit of anxiety. Yeah. Thanks. Anything on our side, this side of the table? Lauren? Um, yeah, I mean, I I really appreciate the input. I mean, I am someone who like works professionally to protect the environment. So the, you know, conversation about protecting our bridge lines and you know really resonates with me. I care a lot about that. And the environmental benefits of developing dense downtown housing are huge to not be sprawling out with all the associated transportation costs for people and walkability and there's so many benefits to having dense housing, which is what our community should be so I, I, I think moving forward in that direction, and just the comfort that a lot of the concerns i'm hearing. We have other zoning with steep slopes and all kinds of considerations around traffic and other things that came up that I think that will be dealt with and that some of the kind of worst case scenarios I don't envision coming through um, and I think it could be a really great project um, on the solar issue. Um, I appreciate the the conversation and the ongoing thinking about how that could be dealt with. I mean, I would love to see something I do. It does seem extremely restrictive to say you can't have any <laughs> any moment of shade on any property. You know, again, the benefits of being able to do dense housing are you know, a huge environmental benefit. So balancing that with solar access, um, you know, I, I, I was like trying to look at if there's like way to propose language or I mean, maybe it is something that we could bring up or if it's coming up as a real um, issue that's hamstringing the kind of infield 
development we want to see. Um, I would certainly be interested. I was, I was having trouble taking the input that we got into specific language because I would like to, to to go from like any shade anywhere all the time from like no shade. It seems like there's a middle ground here and appreciate Mike putting some thoughts into what it could look like. But I don't know if anyone else had any like specific language that they had seen that jumped out at them to propose tonight. But um, no, I, I'm where you are. I think that uh, that we can get there. And I don't think we have a specific sentence to amend the ordinance that would do that. But I think we can get there because I think we mostly are looking at it the same way, but but not not for this package not, of amendments. Right. Yeah. But just want to express that mm -hmm. desire to get there from my part as someone who had proposed removing the language as originally proposed. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Are we set? Uh, if not, if we are, then I will close the public hearing. And what we could do at this time is uh, hear a motion to approve uh, or adopt the uh, proposed ordinance or, or any other motion that someone would want to make. I'll make a motion that we adopt proposed ordinances. Second. Second. All right. I Is there? Don't know if we should do them as separate, um, because they are two separate hearings with two separate ordinances. I don't know if it should be two separate votes. Okay. Because so. we technically are doing a hearing for the updating unified development regulations, and there's also the update of the river Water hazard fit. area regulations. Yep. Why don't Why don't we do them separately? So. So you want a motion to update the river? hazardous ordinances is that the right name i i think it was in the the cover it's a, i believe it was to approve the river hazard area amendment as proposed well my ipad crashed i don't have that oh. available <laughs> <laughs> maybe somebody else can make a motion i don't have the language sorry i think bill is finding it yeah Okay, the uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, approval of each of the yes. Yeah. So, in the case of the unified development regulation, most would be. Uh, yeah, I'm, I can hardly hear myself here. In the case of the unified development regulations, the motion will be to approve the proposal as amended. In the case of the river hazard area regulations and amendments, the motion is to approve as presented, assuming no changes. Two recommended motions. So, was your first motion to approve the uh, unified zoning unified zoning bylaw as amended? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's your second, Jennifer. Yes. <coughs> and, and and John, have we? Is that clear enough for you? Oh, we overwhelmed you. It's great. Okay. Thank no, you. That one was easy. All okay. right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and is is there any uh, further discussion on uh, Donna's motion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We've adopted the uh, proposed bylaw amendments. Next up. The motion is uh, to the adopt the river hazard area regulation amendments as presented. I'll yeah. make that motion. Second. All right, it's moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion on that? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And we the motion is carried. Okay. I would like to uh, thank, thank Mike. So this, this was a great, great presentation. Uh, and thanks to all the people who uh, participated. Uh, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the agenda because it's just past 10 o'clock and we have a number of things on our agenda, we have the Girton Park structure discussion, the uh, locker uh, discussion, 
the uh, NBRC grant discussion. And we have also have a confidential uh, personnel matter on our agenda. Um, and so I'm wondering if maybe we should do Girton Park and uh, move the uh, so locker. The, the grant has, the grant has yeah. a deadline. Yeah, so we have to do that, yeah. No, I was... The, the, the lockers and the personnel update could wait. Okay, well, I would... Could I ask that you take the Garden Park into another meeting because some of the people, especially Susan, had to leave to get into the shelter and... I've been here for three hours, so... What's your pleasure? Yeah, I, I think we should go ahead with the Girton. Oh, sorry, I think we should go ahead with the Girton Park discussion since um, it's been on the agenda for a while and a lot of people have been counting on it happening tonight. And what do you all feel about moving the locker and the personnel discussion to a future meeting. Yes. Okay, that's what we'll do. So we're taking up uh, item number um, 2022-109, uh, Girton Park structure. And I assume we're looking to Cameron. Hi, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the Assistant City Manager. Thank you for letting me be here today. I'm also the staff support for the homelessness task force um, and I am not coming to you with any recommendations, but I did want to give you sort of an overview of what the conversation has been and then I will. Um, uh, see myself out of that conversation and pass it over to um, Council Member Casey or Ken if he's still here so um, if they would like to say anything so. I wanted to sort of structure this by saying this has been an ongoing conversation and I appreciate all the input and feedback that the community has had um, about this uh, topic. I think it has brought a lot of the struggles that folks who are experiencing homelessness um, deal with on the daily and it has really brought some of this conversation to the forefront of people's minds where it may not have ever been before. So. Um, this has been discussed at a few different council meetings. Back in 2020, council had approved to move the gazebo that was at the Girton Park on the bike path um, due to an increased amount of complaints of people feeling unsafe in that space. So we've moved it to an open, an open lot that we had. At the time, uh, we had applied for a grant that would hopefully allow us to make it more of a parklet, if you will. The original intent was to have the uh, gazebo facing a few amenities in that lot, but we were not successful in that grant, but we moved the gazebo anyway. So um, at, uh, since that time, there have been um, on a staff side, quite a lot of calls. You were provided some examples of those. Um, there might not be a full accounting of the calls that have been at that location as it's not an exact location, right? So um, it's hard to track things that don't have an exact location, but we have experienced a high number of public safety and um, public health calls to the current location. Um, staff did hear uh, quite a bit of requests to um, give you options if you did decide that you wanted to move it. Some of the options that we had discussed included Elm Street uh, in the recreation area over by North Branch Park, Dog River, a section of the bike path all off of Old Country Road, some Hubbard Park locations with caveats about how the gazebo um, is structured, and then keeping the gazebo where it is, rotating it so the front faces the street. When I got this project approved to the DRC, one of their stipulations was that the pad that the gazebo is, like, is on uh, was large enough to accommodate that. So we could do that if that is the request. Um, all of those options come with negatives. Most of those are in the floodplain and would need to be uh, anchored 
would require anchoring. Um, it is important and it was brought up in some of the meetings uh, looking to continue to beautify the space where it's at now, that 12 Main Street lot. Some of the issues with that is that it is a brown field. We can't dig on it, which is why the gazebo is placed where it is. Um, if we wanted to move it on that lot further, we would need to do some, uh, probably some site studies if we wanted to put it on a pad or something that wouldn't disrupt the soil. I, I'm not even sure if that's possible, to be honest with you. I have to check with one of our engineers. So that's why it is where it is now. That's sort of the story behind it and some of the options that we were asked to come up with for other locations. I will say that I included all of the notes from some of the Homelessness Task Force's special meetings on this topic and some of their other discussions on it. A lot of them have been doing, uh, a lot of the members of the Homelessness Task Force have been doing a great job talking to those who are experiencing homelessness and getting their feedback about the location. Um, it is in your packet, but a lot of the notes that we've gotten and the feedback we've gotten is that the gazebo, while it is not an appropriate space for shelter, as it does not serve that function well, if at all, is the only option that a lot of people have during the day, and that it is meeting an unmet need. And they wanted to impress upon everyone that there's always gonna be a need for a place to go. Um, and I would also say that in response to that, uh, there is a recognition that y'all have put a lot of money into your next fiscal year budget to sort of address some of these issues in a more holistic way. Um, other feedback we've gotten from the homelessness task force is that they would like to see it made stay downtown or something equivalent be built in the downtown as it's a very easy place for providers to find folks. Um, some of the arguments I've also heard is that um, some of those emergency calls would have happened anyway. Now we know where they are. Um, so again, um, I'll sort of see my way out of this conversation. I just wanted to give you a little rundown on the history and some of the feedback we have gotten. Um, and that, again, we are as staff not coming with a recommendation on this. Yeah, if I can take a look. Yeah. I, I, recognizing the hour, I'll try to do this as quickly as I can, but I'd actually like to give an even longer history lesson. And first of all, I acknowledge that you know we're talking about this in some regard because I raised it at the last meeting, and um, and recommended that it be moved because it is because of the drain on the city's resources right now. It is our highest call volume for police and fire responses, um, and it is not, in my opinion, functioning the way it was intended to be functioning, at least in in its initial inception. But about the lot. That it's in in general i think it's helpful to understand the history of that lot um, some of us may remember there used to be um, montpelier beverage was located on that lot and then there was a parking lot next to it uh, at the time the city was acquiring those properties as part of the one taylor project to put the bike path through the original plan called for montpelier beverage to purchase essentially the parking lot part i'm trying to make this as simple as possible put in uh, some sort of retail on the first floor and either offices or housing to, and they got approval for a three-store building through our planning process and we worked out the the details of you know us purchasing their lot them purchasing our lot again i'm simplifying this a little bit uh and that was what was going to happen so it was going to be a commercial space there and in fact the parking behind was designed to sort of go with that building Literally the day before the closing, the folks at the Moat Trust who own Montpelier Beverage said, you know what, we don't really want to do this. We think it's probably just cleaner and easier if we just sold you our parcel and um, not do the rest of the deal. So at that point, the city became the, the sort of owner of all, all of this property. Uh, and there was some discussion about should the remaining parcel, what you see now, uh, be open space parkland? Should it be developed? What should it be? And uh, so while there was some conversation, we decided that in order to complete the project and deal with the brownfields, we would just grass it over because that gave us the most options. Um, so there was a, a working group formed to discuss what should happen with this parcel. And the conclusion of that was, we shouldn't really be talking about this parcel um, on its own. We should be looking at it in the context of the entire downtown. And so it was folded into the downtown master plan taking a look at the various needs of downtown. And the recommendation of that process was that this parcel should be developed, that it should 
the city should seek to a private partner and develop it in some sort of private way and not have it be a park. And that was essentially the direction where we were headed in, uh, you know, sort of fall winter of November of 2019. And then in spring of 2020, of course, COVID hit and everything stopped. Uh, so there has been no further work on that lot. Uh, and we actually have scheduled um, this spring on our list of items is the resolution of what to do with that part with that property. So one of the reasons we were hesitant, at least at our end to invest a lot into that property is that there is no um, there's no firm decision about the future of that property as a whole, uh, not just this one structure. Uh, so that is still a decision left for you to make, but I think it's helpful to understand that it's hasn't necessarily been targeted for open space or for long term parkland and that it is left as this sort of open grass space um, because that was the way to complete the work at that time and the way that would allow the most options in the future. Cameron's correct that it's a little sloped because of the one part of it has restrictions about uh, excavations, another part of it does not. So the buildings would have to go on the, the part that is not. So just a little more context. I know, um, you know, I, it's one of those things I assume everybody knows and then I look around the room and say, um, <laughs> you know what, we've had a lot of new people since this all started. So I think it's helpful to, to have that background. But with that, I know there's been a robust community discussion about this. And, uh, you know, I think I feel we've raised our concerns and we will do what the council says and we'll make it a success regardless of what it is. Thanks, Bill. Connor, to you. Yeah, sure. I'll just, just say a few words about the process, and then I, I have my own uh, feelings about this and want to have Ken say a few words. But um, obviously a pretty emotional discussion, as you've heard. And uh, I want to start by thanking Cameron. Probably there's never been as much work done on an eight-foot piece of property as uh, Cameron's done, looking at the different options here uh, and doing the different uh, meetings we've had this week. Uh, you know, some of it's symbolism, I think, but there, there is meaning in symbols. And um, I, I would channel the mayor in saying we should assume best intentions in folks, you know. Um, certainly, I think there have been comments that I, I would say are prejudice, but, um, you know, there are also some very legitimate concerns. Uh, as Bill said, the drain on city resources, uh, the litter's been out of control to the point of being a, you know, health issue at times. Um, there's been, you know, cases of, of, of harassment with folks passing by, uh, and that shouldn't be taken lightly a bit, um, not, not a bit, it's, it's not an ideal situation. Um, that said, uh, it, it absolutely serves a purpose right now. Um, and if you talk to service providers, I don't know if Don Little's here, um, I, I know we have another way obviously represented, um, but the value in being able to in a centralized place that's accessible to folks facing disabilities, uh, have a chat with folks, direct them to services, be there if there's an emergency where there has been to intervene and make sure they're safe and healthy um, is definitely preferable in my mind to pushing folks into the shadows, uh, which I think we have a tendency to do sometimes if we don't like the behavior going on. Um, so you've had all these sort of conflicting viewpoints uh, come together there. Um, but as they have, you know, and I, I would compare it to the camping proposal a bit that we had last summer there. Uh, as we've had folks who have these different opinions come together, uh, one thing that's been a bit beautiful, I think, is a lot of folks coming to the table with, uh, with, with some solutions, you know, and they might be valuable, they might not be, but it's a matter of your community coming together, recognizing these issues and saying, okay, it's not just gonna be one meeting. It's not just gonna be one structure. We all have to come together. We all have to think of solutions and it's gonna be a long-term issue. The homelessness task force is looking into the future. And like, I do wanna say, you know, this structure, it's not a magical thing, right? <laughs> it's not, there's nothing magic about it, right? We have an increased homeless population, people experiencing homelessness or people feeling isolation after this pandemic. And it served a place for them to like come, come centralize, but we, we need those long-term decisions. And I think the warming shelter with $425,000 banked into the next, um, next year's budget with the RFP going out pretty soon, we'll look at a lot of these issues here and hopefully come to some better solutions then where do we put this little piece, little structure, right? 
Um, so anyways, I think there has been value to it. It's, it's been a bumpy road. I'm glad we did it. Um, you know, hopefully we come up with some decision tonight. And again, I do have my own personal thoughts on this that I'll come back to, but I, I think it would make sense maybe for uh, Ken to relay some of the uh, thoughts of the folks on the task force, which he's been writing down, taking notes. We're either way. Either at the table or okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and do identify yourself. I feel like Joe Biden. Take off my mask. I'm going to speak. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Ken Russell uh, with the Montpelier Homelessness Task Force, and I'm the director at Another Way. And Zach Hughes. I'm an outreach person at Prepare Plus, a private organization. Thank you. So um, I do have a few remarks. Um, first of all, uh, we're grateful to have had the opportunity to weigh in and to reach out to folks and to get input. There's really been some fantastic discussions, very thoughtful, um, what you were saying about similar to the camping discussion. I mean, you'll, there's a lot of common ground. I mean, you'll, you'll hear people who may be strong critics of a camping ordinance or people using Girton Park will we'll preface it by, you know, we, we got to take care, of, we got to look out for these folks, um, you know, we'll emphasize the importance of, of the humanity of all of this. And then, um, so that, you know, the assumed positive intent is is very strong. Um, there, ha there has been some ugliness in, in different quarters um, in, in these chambers at the, at the park on Front Porch Forum. And I, and I do think that, you know, looking to our better angels is, is part of what we need to do. And it has really tangible benefits. Um, one of the, in the, in, in, there are about 100 people who weighed in in meetings I've been part of. Um, I mean, including we had a big meeting in another way on this. Um, we had the coffee at Rabble Rousers. We had the, the, the meeting last Thursday. We had our homelessness task force. Um, there were not a lot of strong voices, hardly any saying, got to move it. A lot of people, are, can we just adjust it? We can do this. And what that says to me is there are a lot of functions, as others have alluded to, that it does meet. It has, it's, um, you know, it, it was designed to, to, to be on the bike path so bikers could stop and drink water, and it's turned into something different. Um, and I just want to say on that score, we, we do have to be careful uh, when we hear folks saying, well, it's not what it was designed for. Well, it was designed to be a, a public space. And a certain category of folks of the public have been utilizing that space. And so what we don't want to do is be in a situation where we're saying there's a certain class of people who don't belong in our public space. And I'm sure we can all agree with that. Um, and, I, and I know, and again, not to diminish some of the behavioral concerns that people have raised. Um, um, I, I've definitely been out there and, uh, you know, some, some of the situation out there has, has disgusted me. I've also seen tremendous humanity out there. I've seen people helping other people get out of uh, situations that were dangerous for their recovery. Um, Susan, who had to leave early, she, I, I don't know if you've been paying attention in the last few weeks. She has been cleaning that thing. She has been, as she said, like the, the, the den mother. She's been asking for gloves and garbage bags. She's been coordinating with, with neighboring businesses. You know, so, so that, you know, there have been people, of course, bringing food by to people. Um, there have been, well, this is over at the transit center, but the same populations making music and singing songs and dancing. So it's just important not to get hooked up on the caricature and understand the, you know, the full spectrum of, of these of these folks. I know there's I know it's late, so I'll, I'll skip through one, one thing that is a concern is if and this was expressed by a lot of people at these meetings, if this this goes away, you, you might well have a lot of people in doorways downtown. People have some need to have somewhere to go. Um, we had some folks in another way talking about that. Yeah, we're just trying to we're just trying to move along. We just don't know where to go. And, and, there, and it's, it kind of reminds me of the grapes of wrath. You know, people just being moved along from place to place or, or Snoopy, no dogs allowed. I don't know if you remember that. But, um, <laughs> but seriously, um, it, it's like I, I have to say, it's like there, there is not enough housing. We have 
300 and some odd people in motels in Washington County. We have 75 up at the Hilltop. We have 100, I mean 75 at the Econo. We have 100 at the Hilltop. There are their own challenges there. We, we, people are not landing in this situation because of their moral failings. I mean, I'm sure you could point to anecdotally, yeah, this person, yeah, yeah. But this is economics. This is supply and demand in the housing market. And we all, you know, we know what's happening for middle class families, um, you know, here, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, like trying to get some kind of movement on housing. It's, it was, it was fat, you know, interesting to hear the zoning discussion. So what are we going to do? And this is going to get worse. And if, if you're, in a, you know, as an environmentalist, we have to learn how to live in cities. We have to learn how to live with a lower footprint. We need to learn how to how to share space. Part of sharing space is I'm up against a, a person that makes me feel uncomfortable. How do I share space with this person? You know, so um, I was in the bookshelf. I just reached. I was in the other room while you all were talking on something else on the Elks. And I just grabbed this book from Krishnamurti, and I'm just going to read this. And, it, and I just want to preface this by saying this is not meant to be judgmental of anybody, but more of the sort of challenge I think we all have. Why do we hate the poor? Do you really hate the poor? I am not condemning you. I am just asking, do you really hate the poor? And if you do, why? It is because you also may be poor one day, and imagining your own plight then, you reject it or that you dislike the sordid, dirty, unkempt existence of the poor, disliking untidiness, disorder, squalor, filth. You say, I don't want to have anything to do with the poor. Is that it? But who has created poverty, squalor, and disorder in the world? Your parents, your government, our whole society has created them. Because you see, we have no love in our hearts. We love neither our children nor our neighbors, neither the living nor the dead. We have no love for anything at all. And he goes on and on about love. No, um, no, but it's like, do you love anything? Do you know what it is completely love? And I, I really feel like, and this is, sounds corny in a meeting like this, but you know, how, how do we love the folks that might make us feel uncomfortable? Thank you, and, I, and, uh, and on a more, and, and I know these are some tough decisions, and I know that as Cameron, uh, Connor says, there's, there's symbolism here. And so I'm being a little bit philosophical here. Um, but we do appreciate everybody's good efforts here. Um, and I just want to reiterate the call for having something downtown and for a few reasons. I mean, first of all, it's where people are. It's already the current geography of, of uh, this population. It's it's the downtown center. And it's also where we're we are a city. And, and part of what a city does is people end up there gritty as they are and they figure out how to share space together when when I first got involved with homelessness issues 25 years ago in in Palo Alto in California um, I taught it was we there was a talk about the acts of enclosure and like the commons they're making it illegal to sit or lie on the sidewalk downtown and I saw the housing market drive artists and everybody out of those communities and you know what's happened in San Francisco and it's happening here in in Vermont, and so, you know, how do we design our space in a way um, that that meets social justice challenges? Um, you know, they had a sustainable Montpelier design comp competition. How about a social justice design competition? Uh, from, uh, Ward is here. Ward has beautiful visions about public space. Um, the students at Vermont Technical College did some great visions, visions for a visions for a um, day shelter, and as Connor said, we and and thank you for the support of of our, our agenda, the financial support, and thank you for the taxpayers who who are investing in in this. We, we, and I think hiring a consultant to help. Um, fine tune how to bring down this, you know, how to spend wisely this, this money, the, the $400,000 and do something we can all feel good about and, and really does make a difference is, is something uh, fantastic. So thank you for your time. And Zach. So I, uh, well, I, I've been rehearsing this for a while, but I'll just stay brief and submit things in writing at this point. 
decision or no decision tonight, Al Smith still. I am um, Zachary Hughes. I am also a citizen over at Prospect Street in Montpelier and uh, also on the Homelessness Task Force. But I'm also a service provider. I wear a couple hats, so, you know, out there. So um, that I will echo the downtown thing. I really think it's really necessary to have something um, if this if this doesn't uh, work out. And I do um, understand the concerns, I get it, um, but there are concerns also from our side. And, um, and I just need to say something from Susan who had to leave early to go into shelter. So we're talking about real time here. Uh, she actually had to go into a sh into the warming shelter or the overflow, so she couldn't stay the whole time. Uh, she reiterated that um, that uh, she was concerned about sanitation, um, you know. And uh, what's beautiful is I'm hearing that within the next year we ought to be able to have that figured out with these fundings, and the, and we've talked about it for two years. To be fair to some people, but yeah, bathrooms are. The little big thing, and I know we didn't, that potty thing went somewhere and haven't found it yet. But anyway, that's one thing, and she just feels, uh, she said some people are feeling defeated out there. So I think this is, um, you know, and, and just real quick, I have introduced a initiative at the uh, Homelessness Task Force that I learned at the state level called Build for Zero, and uh, this is buildforzero.org. Um, and we're looking at this um, because only municipalities can can really touch this or join this. Um, this isn't something I can take my service provider thing and do. So we're looking at that, and I appreciate your time this evening. I'll submit the rest in writing. Thank you. Um, let's start with members of the council, see if anyone has any questions or comments to uh, to move this along well there are, I know there are people in the public and I will be uh, taking comments from them too thank you thanks yeah Jennifer um, I don't have any questions I just um, I, I have some comments um, I've, I've worked um, with homeless populations for 20 years and I myself have been homeless and um, you know there's a lot of people in town that are one paycheck away from being on the streets and we keep talking about the need for housing and the need for space and I think that that is our intention is to provide that for folks um, but I also think it's important to remember that we are city council and it takes time and I know that's not what a lot of people have and um, I would appreciate if if people could give us just a little bit of patience um, this is really hard work and um, these are people's lives and we're not taking it lightly we're taking this very seriously um, I don't think anybody sitting up here does not care about the people that are over at Garden Park um, and I've gotten a lot of really horrible emails from people. And, you know, that's my role. I'm, I'm taking people's opinions and ideas and thoughts. Um, but it's really hard to have people that don't know me or my life make assumptions about my opinions and my thoughts. And so I'm, I'm putting them out here. I, I am absolutely in support of helping all of our community members, especially those that don't have anywhere to go. Um, I understand that this is a very touchy subject for folks, but I, I'm asking for my constituents and community members to give me some space and time to think about what is the right decision, because I don't want to make a decision based on emotions. <laughs> I want to make a decision based on what's best for everyone in this situation, and it's not an easy decision to make. Um, and also, I'd like to say that if you would like me to agree with you or hear you i would appreciate it that you came to me with respect that's a huge thing for me because it's part of my culture and i would never come at anybody with disrespect so i'm i'm just asking if, if you want me to support 
your ideas, community ideas, um, please come to me with respect. Please don't come to me with your anger and frustration because I too am frustrated by the situation. So thank you, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Anybody else up here? Yeah, anybody else wants to go first? Like, like blab on, but um, yeah, no, first, uh, th thanks a lot for that, Jennifer. You know, it, it means a lot. And, uh, you know, it may sound cheesy, but like uh, you hear the term eyesore thrown around a lot. And sure enough, the structure can be an eyesore, but people can't be an eyesore. They can't. They, they all have their own stories there. And I, I, you know, I've learned with all these hearings, a lot of those like personal stories. <laughs> Um, and it, it's actually been quite moving. Um, you know, I, I, I worry it's a slippery slope. If, you know, you don't like people who are sitting on a public structure and you move it, where does it go? Uh, the weather's getting nice. We're about to set up benches in downtown Montpelier. If somebody sits on one of the benches that we don't like, do we remove the benches, you know? We've already moved it from the bike path because of some of these concerns. You know, we, we move it here, we move it again. As Ken said, like the issues don't go away, and people will always need a place to find shelter. And part of the reason the homelessness task force was created at the beginning was some of the issues with folks hanging out downtown in some of the merchants' like doorways here. Um, if we move it, like we got to move it with eyes wide open, because the parklet policy that we just approved entitles anybody to sit in these parklets at the end of business hours here. That's where folks will go, and they should go there because they have nowhere else to go. We're getting a lot of complaints, right? I worry if we don't get these calls for emergency services because that means somebody's in the shadows who might need help there, and they're not getting the care they need. Um, so, you know, whether you have a house or not, um, it, it's a different population. Again, everybody has their own stories. Some people are up at the hotels. Some people are just isolated, and it's a sense of community, and it's a very small thing, but it's something it provides. Um, and I... You know, I, I think I've evolved in my thinking over this, but, um, you know, we, we, we face logistical problems and that we actually don't have much city property in downtown Montpelier. Um, the, the options outlined in the memo, um, a lot of them are good options, maybe for the future use of the structure, but I, I can't support moving it unless we have a clear uh, downtown replacement that's accessible to services that could serve a substitute function to it. Uh, because otherwise what we're doing is just, I think, turning a blind eye to some of these issues, even if we can't solve them in the immediate future. Um, I, I believe it keeps people safer, actually, leaving it as is. So that, that's just where I'm coming from. Yep. Um. Yeah, so this this one is a um, this is really tough, right? Everyone everyone agrees on that, and and I think we have a lot of competing issues going on here, and um, we're we're thinking really hard about people's lives and people's safety, and about how we care for everybody who lives in Montpelier, and and the idea that we we move the structure. Um, clearly does not solve the problem of the people who are using the structure now and have needs for it. I would love to see an alternate plan so that we only move the structure if we had somewhere else for folks to go. And at the same time, I don't see that alternate plan happening right now. And we have a current situation that has a lot of significant problems that I'm also not seeing a solution for. So I feel like we're really stuck. We have something that doesn't really work in some major ways. And if we just move the structure, then we have something else that doesn't work in some really major ways. Um, so I am looking to the homelessness task force largely to try to give us some solutions to this right now. Uh, I know that longer term, we may have some more solutions coming, although I don't, you know, I, I think we'll still have some major gaps because that's just the nature of this. So that's where, that's where I am right now. And I, and I appreciate everybody who has put so much thought into this and is so, and the, the compassion that I hear from people and the true caring for 
people who live in Montpelier, I uh, just really want to appreciate that. Thanks, Carrie. Donna? Uh, I guess along those lines, I've been thinking about having an intentional structure that would increase the amount of people who could socialize, something that would work, if not totally protect from the elements, at least something three-sided. Um, and one of the discussions came up with a space that was talked about before behind another way of putting shell, sh sh uh, we talked about it before with showers. And I thought, well, why not put at least another alternative? Maybe we need more than one space. But, um, you know, so I mentioned it to Ken and some others, and it's not shoving people off of Main Street, but thinking about here's a space, it's, a, it's near where they're also getting services. And so I'd like to go in that direction. And I guess it's the same way. I'd like to have one happening that we can research and find out because at one point we had potentially some private people who could get involved with that project at another way uh, property, but it takes some time to invest in it. But I'd rather do that before we take away what's now being used. This is Zach and I did have a follow up. They, in one of our meetings, we've heard uh, feedback about opening up more areas for people to be able to go to instead of being uh, stuck in uh, certain areas. Uh, this was very encouraging to hear this idea. Um, it was just laid out like build more of these and, you know, and the space make the space shareable with others. One of the other ideas we heard or other comments was they didn't, uh, a citizen didn't feel comfortable using that space. <laughs> Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could equalize it somehow? Thank you. Do you want to say anything now, Lauren? You don't have to. Oh, wait for okay. it. There's a lot of public. Okay, yeah, there's this, there's some public comment. I'm going to start with people online because they're uh, are, have, our hands have been up uh, for a while, starting with Peter Kelman. Uh, Peter yeah. Kelman. And I encourage everyone to be brief because it is already. 10.38 p.m. Right. Peter Kelman. Um, uh, I, I, I pretend that I'm a man from Mars, and I've arrived here, and I was listening to this. And I, I go, well, yeah, you've got that piece of land. You've got a need to have something downtown. You need bathrooms. You need showers. You need lockers. So why not build something in that piece of land that has all those things? In the meantime, because you have to do something now before you move the structure, there are spaces behind another way and on Stonecutter's way. Let's think about solving the problem, not focusing on the obstacles. Yes, you'll have to deal with the obstacles at some point, but start thinking about some ways to use empty stores, uh, empty spaces. We are moving into a warmer period of time. So right now we don't have to worry so much about uh, 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 warming shelters. But let's think about what we can do now and start planning for what we're going to do before next winter. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, next up, we have Morgan Brown. Morgan Brown, <coughs> resident of District 3 in Mapilla. Um, <clears throat> I formerly served on the Homeless Success Force and I've uh, been someone who uh, lived unhoused for many years of my life, but I've been housed for over 12 years now. Um, so back when I was living in house in the area, um, we didn't, there wasn't a grit box structure to go to. And I remember sometimes in the winter even walking around town because I had no place to go to or rest and just walking with all my belongings and I'd sometimes go to that little bus shelter that was at the Taylor Street lot there when the bus used to go there at one time Greyhound and I'd be in there get my feet up and try to stay warm it wasn't easy and that was at night daytime you know I when the state law library was open during the week I'd go there well the public library pandemic hit, you know, and for those that, well, of course, state library isn't around anymore for people. So, you know, when, especially with the pandemic, people have less place to go. 
And one thing should be noted with Girton Park is not everybody that uh, gathers there is living in house. There's many people who gather there and socialize who are housed. Uh, and uh, including myself, but also others. And um, it provides a central location. And even though it's less than ideal, um, you know, it does provide a certain amount of socialization. Uh, the previous location of it provided a certain amount of privacy. Here, there's none. And, uh, you know, the other day, Saturday, I believe, you know, I happened to witness an altercation that was pretty bad verbally uh, abusive, but then turned into a physical one. And now if Girton Park wasn't there, you know, maybe that incident might have happened somewhere else out of sight, out of mind, maybe it would have been worse. So, you know, for all the concerns about what is going on, it's important to realize that, as people have mentioned, that the current location it is meeting a certain need. And, you know, if I was living in a house now, where would I go? Where would you go? Where would your loved ones go? Your family members, your close friends? Think about that. And so, although this might take a while to try to figure out and do something about, it, it is important to try to do something as soon as possible to help with what is a growing need. And it's only gonna get worse. We've got people being evicted. You know, we've got people who will be, you know, not able to go into the motels. We've got the uh, overflow shelter closing soon, as I understand. So, you know, uh, there you go. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, next up, we have Don Little online. Hey, um, I'm Don Little. I'm employed by Good Samaritan Haven. I am a resident, a member of the task force, and a street outreach worker. Um, some of this will be somewhat redundant. We've heard some of it before. Um, as far as the task, as the uh, Girton Park structure itself is concerned, um, I we, we have a need for something downtown that serves the purposes Girton Park is serving. And I personally don't have no preference. I would like to see it used for what it was originally meant for, but I feel that it's at least as important that these these functions be served somehow. And right at the moment, it seems to be what we have. Um, if Girton Park is moved, um, which I do not prefer at the moment, I would ask that we consider moving it to someplace not really far away, but somewhere where low, lower income people or people without cars could use it. Um, not to Dog River or some or Hubbard Park or someplace that's already considered recreational, but to one of those neighborhoods the woman was talking about earlier, where they don't have parks, they don't have central areas in the neighborhood, or to or to again Mill Pond Park. Um, my preference would be for it to stay in town for the moment until or unless we can come up with a substitute, but that it be moved back from the street because I really don't think that that works for anyone. Um, you know, I believe that we need a place that is centrally located for all the reasons people have mentioned before. But in addition, because people, whether they are housed or unhoused, need a place where they can sit down, where they can get out of the weather. Um, a lot of people can't walk that far to get to bathrooms. So having it in the downtown area near the services and the, and the bathrooms is a good idea having it accessible is a good idea. I think in addition to that, it provides privacy for people without housing. It provides an ability for people to find each other. I know when new people come to town or even local residents who are newly without housing due to job loss or divorce or being exited from their apartment or whatever, people go to the Girton Park and they call me. I mean, I get many calls from people at Girton Park saying, hey, there's a new person here. They don't have a phone. They don't know where to go. You know, can you talk to them? And that wouldn't be happening if people were widely dispersed. 
Um, it's kind of an instinctive place that people first go when they don't know where to go. They don't know what services are available. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't know, you know, and, and it gives them an opportunity to be oriented and to get in touch with appropriate services. Um, and it's also a point of stability for people who don't have a home. You know, you have a place you go, you read the paper in the morning, you talk to your friends, you, you don't have money to go to a coffee shop. Um, you don't want to sit out in the rain if it's raining, but it just gives people part of a routine. You know, it may be the one stable spot in their day besides going to the shelter, which which won't be available in the summer, by the way. But I would just like to say that I think we have a need for a centrally located, but not right in people's faces. I don't know how to accomplish this. I'm sure there has to be I'm sure we have the money to do this. There must be some corner if we replace Girton Park where we could put a couple tables and a tarp or something, or maybe we could just move Girton Park away from the street. But there's a serious need to have these needs net until we can find something perfect that meets all of the needs. Um, and there will even at that point be a continuing need as there will be more people passing through, there will be more people who need a very low barrier, uncomplicated place just to sit down where they can hear themselves think and not feel like they're being stared at. Um, and that's, you know, it's also true that low income people and people with disabilities need somewhere. And I like the idea of having a variety of inexpensive small places where people can sit so they don't all have to go to the same place. They don't feel pushed out or marginalized if somebody else is occupying their bench they can go to another bench um thank you uh, thanks don uh next up vicky and lane online um yes i'd like to also echo the fact that i do not believe that it should be moved other than maybe to kitty corner it a little bit um and also i i think um Oh, for one, I think it's got to be near the services. Um, I like the fact that it's so close to the fire department so that if there's medical needs, they're really close um, and the police can check in on them. And so can varying assorted people that also check in on them periodically. Um, it is a terribly small spot, a small structure. So um, I'm going to propose something radical that probably will get me thrown out of businesses in town or not welcomed. But I think we should maybe um, construct a few more on that spot. Um, maybe another couple, three um, similar structures on that spot for people to get out of the rain and make sure that the, the roofs overhang enough to where there's no rain coming into them. Um, it's very important that, um, that people are able to get out of the, the rain and visit with other people, other like people. The, um, the, the structure that I've seen is when there's several people there, there isn't enough room in that structure for all of them. And some of them end up sitting or standing outside of it. And, um, you know, I it's too small for people to be comfortably um, socializing in. So I, I really do think that we should construct some lean-to type things and maybe make, make them a little more secure and weatherproof better than the one, than the Girton one, um, which was not designed to be weather, weatherproof. Um, I think that's why you saw some of the tarps go up around the, the Girton structure in the winters because they were trying to make it as comfortable as they could. Um, and I do think um, that as citizens of Montpelier that we really do need to welcome these people too. They are also our fellow citizens. Um, even though they may not live like the rest of us, um, I certainly don't live like my neighbors live. Um, and I don't live like anybody else 
really lives. So everybody's different. And I think that we ought to embrace that and um, protect people. Um, I don't know what, well, this is really going to get me into trouble. Um, but I don't know why people are not taking shelter um, at City Hall on the steps or in the overhang there when it's really rainy or stormy or whatever, you can get out of the out of the weather. Um, I don't know why we don't let people kind of sit there, um, but I guess they don't. And I guess it's been a problem. But anyway, so I think we need to really, um, I mean, it's a perfect little park place for um, people that are unhoused or um, or their social circle needs a place to meet, um, even if they are housed, um, that's a convenient spot. So uh, that's basically all I have to say. I would like to encourage us to um, construct more rather than remove what's there, just because some people find it to be an eyesore. I don't find it an, an eyesore, but um, I know other people who have less compassion may find it an eyesore. Uh, thanks, Vicki. Um, Dawn, your hand is still up, but I suspect that it may be because uh, you just haven't taken it down. And so I'm going to uh, look in the room and see if there are people in the room who would want to speak. Uh, yes, we have Ward Joyce uh, first up. Thank you. So I went by the Girton Pocket Park today and I saw, I think, eight or 10 people in it. And there was someone that was like, 85 maybe they were listening to music they were talking they were chatting and i actually found it the most vibrant part of downtown montpelier <laughs> on the other hand it's a disaster as a public space and i said this the other night um there's a principle in public space design that i didn't invent the, the project for public space has codified it and it's called the power of seven and it means that if you want to build a public space you need seven things in that space could be a trash can, a bench, a bike rack, a pavilion, newspapers. When you have seven things, you bring people to a space. So that space is mostly being complained about because it has an absence of anything of quality as a public space. So, Bill, I understand that the that it isn't meant necessarily to be there for 10 years and you might want to build a building. I'd like you to revisit with the community i know you so, will so i'm, I'm just not, inviting I'm saying you. i want to build a building no, no, no. that was what was i'm inviting you to revisit with the community whether the community as a whole really does want another building or whether that might become a gateway park to montpelier which for visitors is a pretty dismal way to enter our city not because of girton pocket park and not because of the homeless but because we don't have a public space and we don't have good city fabric there so I love the last idea, the notion of making that a better pocket park. I think spinning it around and making the cur current piece address the street and then building a much better one in the back of the park for the folks that like to hang out there. It's clearly an important space, but it's just poorly underdesigned, And so it is going to fail. It is going to raise people's hair because it's a terrible use of an open space. So I challenge the city to develop that space, even temporarily, better. More, better, gooder. That's really bad English. No, I just, it should be better conceived of. So instead of moving it a mile away, which you did to the skateboarders 10 years ago, which was really cruel, to take the kids from downtown and say, you can go skateboard about a mile away. It's a really bad urban gesture to move an amenity away. So I encourage the community to come together and assist the city in making that space, even temporarily, a better place. And it needs to be pumped up with energy and not removed of what's there. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, yes. And I know you said your name. I'm sorry, I just forget it. My name? You're up. Yes. Yes, come on up. Mary. 
Oh, okay, you're up. Right. You're up. I'm so I'm so right damn tired. I had to lay down. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, I was interested in those other things too. Just ask you to say your name. Say your name. Pardon me. Just say your name. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, Mary from uh, Messier from Lewis Street. Um, yeah, I I've talked to Don a lot about this and other people, and um. Yep, I'm totally into making that space better. Um, so while I was home tonight at five o'clock thinking about coming here on my bicycle all the time, um, you know, I started doodling. You know, I was getting excited about it. So I'm, I made a little map. I made a little map. It has, uh, so my idea is would be angle. It's a goofy map. I know I didn't draw it great. <laughs> angle. Girton Park. I think I got seven items in here. <laughs> so cool. Uh, got a picnic table, uh, maybe even two. Uh, bench, bench, uh, thing of flowers, small benches, two trash recycle areas. Um, so yeah, I, I don't feel um, when it first got put there, I, I didn't feel comfortable with how it was facing. It, it just didn't feel right. And um, it didn't look good. And um, I do see the need. I, I hope it doesn't get moved off someplace. Although I do get upset with um, litter. And um, that's one of my things. I just don't like littering. Um, I hope it doesn't get moved far away, but maybe it could be angled and improved. And if we got to do the GoFundMe, I think that's a great idea. Um, I know this isn't for solving big the problem, but um, I'm not talking very even worse now because I'm really <laughs> tired. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. You may. I I just like doodling a lot too when I'm when I'm thinking. So uh, let's see. My note said maybe move it back about twenty feet, angle it slightly so it's a little bit uh, maybe facing the drawing board, facing the capital, just angle. Um, develop the area. Maybe if we need to do a GoFundMe effort. Um, benches and I would really like to see some of these benches covered minimal with this uh, clear plexi stuff maybe something not real expect you know I don't think you have to put a ton of money into this but um, something simple. Um, yeah so that's basically it but um, I bicycle for about six years in town uh, a lot of it because I didn't have a car. Then when I got a car, unfortunately, the only one I could find is in New Hampshire. And anyways, high mileage, it broke down back to bicycling. But I found it really hard to carry everything I have and be prepared for all weather all the time. And what if my back starts hurting really bad with the arthritis? Because I have it. And there was times I couldn't walk 40 feet, really, I'm telling you. So it's better now. But we need this around the city. We need it for our elderly folks, our disability folks. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that right, but we need it for everyone. And I think I said the story the other night about being down at the um, transit center. I was waiting for the Greyhound. It never showed up. And I found out it left 30 minutes early. So on that side of the street where the Greyhound pulls in, there's no shelter. I mean, if you're disabled or elderly and it's cold, it's raining, what are you doing? You know, you stand there and wait. You could wait, be there early and wait really late because they come in late sometimes. So I really feel that the city needs a bunch of places like, say, I don't know, six at least. And I, I haven't followed the Confluence Park thing, really. I'd like to look at that closer. But I think the city really needs these kind of spaces that are maybe minimal seating, but maybe some coverage so that everyone can sit down when they need to or know that two blocks away, there's a space where they can sit, 
get out of the wind or the sun. I frequently see Maxine Leary in the in the summer walking. She's got her umbrella. She's like 95, 98 now. You know, um, we need this. We really do. And especially with, um, you know, people being encouraged to bicycle and walk more. Um, if we're going to do that, spend six months biking year round or whatever and you'll realize a lot of our infrastructure is not set up for the future not at all we we really need to get there and that doesn't count the transportation and by the way i love the bike path i do it gave okay, Mary, it gave people Mary, some relief could we try okay. to wrap up i'll wrap uh, it gave people a relief and i i wasn't in town right then um i was in barry but it really during covid it gave people an ability to go out, not go in a restaurant, and get a little nature. So thank you. I wasn't even going to show it, but I'm like, I'm for this. No, I want it to thank be you. better. So thank you, and I hope you don't move it really far away. Thank you. Steve. Uh, Stephen Whitaker, uh, it's a, as you recall, most of you recall, I opposed moving it from its prior location because I foresaw this very same uh, competing uses. Uh, uh, there's one piece I want to, it's a one line from a op-ed that was in the New York Times last week. Quote, first, first humans beings are powerfully driven by what are known as the thymotic desires. These are the needs to be seen, respected, appreciated. If you give people the impression that they are unseen, disrespected, and unappreciated, they will become enraged, resentful, and vengeful. They will perceive diminishment as injustice and respond with aggressive indignation. Now, that applies to me as well as a lot of the homeless. And I've been talking to y'all about a lot of priorities for year after year after year, and you ignore them. So yeah, I'm indignant, but I'm also trying to help solve this problem for the homeless folk. And regarding City Hall's portico, one, no, as an alternative, I don't think that's an alternative. Uh, it's tile, it's concrete, it's cold, and there's a brand new surveillance camera hovering over it. Um, the, the Girton Park is wood, it's soft, it's got a little bit of privacy. Um, we don't have time. The Homelessness Task Force has had two years and eight months and accomplished none of, none, none of its goals. And we have empty perfect hot water bathrooms in this building we are just too damn selfish to allow them to be shared and keep them clean you know the police are right across the street they can check on it every hour they're right across the parking lot to not make these public bathrooms available is grossly reckless endangerment and callous indifference on your part um we disrespect the homeless we we treat them like like dirt like unwanted you know we that littering I'm, I'm annoyed as hell by it and i go and reprimand people to pick up after themselves but it's it's an expression it's one of the few voices they have they don't have the luxury of staying out till 10 or 11 o'clock at night to come to a hearing they got to be in the shelter but we got a real problem Tw the christ church is going to close 20 more people out on the street 150 getting getting out, exited from the two hotels good samaritan with a five million dollar grant is only going to house 38 people when in, by july okay we got a real real tsunami of unhoused people coming our way and we have made no progress on renting purchasing toilet trailers that can be pumped out by wind river you know uh shower trailers that can be located in out of the way places where people could access them. We should be designing our city to accommodate people of all incomes and hikers and, and you know, the, the long trail hikers. We, so 
for tonight's problem, I think there's enough votes here to not move it immediately. But I do want to suggest we could move it very soon. Last time there was pushback by only Donna Bate, I believe, at not Donna Bate, Donna Barlow, about locating it on the back of the new parking lot. The new part, there's a knoll right behind. It's it's grown up into weeds five feet tall last year. The weeds are down now. There's a nice level spot. It's it's protected from the bike path by a chain link fence and the bridge. And there's the masking of the noise by the little waterfall below. So that people could have some privacy. They'd have a view of the river. You may or may not need to, I would say keep it six, eight feet from the riprap. You it could even put a fence in to keep any drunk people from falling under the riprap. But I ran that one by, it took Richard Shear there, whom I'm sure you have heard about this issue. He said, that's a good spot. Ward just said, that's a good spot, okay? That's a good spot, especially if you put a toilet trailer in that lot, give up a couple of those parking spaces and put a toilet trailer right in it. That'll take a little pressure off you getting, out, getting our, city, our city hall bathrooms open to the public. And with the idea of the consultant talking about a warming shelter, we don't need a warming shelter. We need a, a, a night shelter. We, we need a single room occupancy with showers and some, a couple of community rooms. Maybe that should be built in the rec, on the site of the rec center, demolished and or on the lot that we're talking about now. So I know you want to shut me up. No, just give him, give him five minutes. I'd like everyone to know on everything. So in any case, I think you've got the idea. If, if, if you must move it, keep it in town, but deal with the, the problem of trash. If you respect people by giving them bathrooms, they won't litter as much. That's common frickin' sense. Thank you. Uh, Chief. Good evening. Uh, council members, uh, Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department. I, this is a situation that none of you all created but it's an unenviable situation that you're bearing a lot of weight on. And it's something that can't be solved by the folks in this room, can't be solved by the state. It's gonna take a partnership and it's gonna take a lot of different things. So if I am, I would personally, from, from, from my point as the chief of police would like to move away from the existential conversation of homelessness and the uncomfortability of it to the behavioral issues. What do you want the Montpelier police to do, because no matter where you put it, no matter what you bring in there, there's going to be a group who are going to act outside in a way that's going to cause a call for service from us or from the fire department. That's just an unfortunate situation of where we're at. There is a lot of conversation about individuals. This is a place where folks need to kind of gather to, to do things. I get that. I understand that other people don't have places to go. But what about the ones who don't have places to go, but are afraid to go to that shelter because they don't want to deal with the substance abuse issues, the assaults or anything else like that. So when the department gets constant calls for service regarding behavioral issues, whether it's drinking in a public way, whether it's defecation or ur urinating inside of someone's hallway room or moving into someone's building, how do you want us to address that? We, we can reach out to Dawn, we can reach out to Ken, but if someone does not want to go to one of those facilities, there is nothing I can do. The complaints will continue to come in and come in. So this is a very unenviable situation, um, which is why I'd never be able to be good in public service. Well, from this point, but, <laughs> but I guess what, what I'm asking specifically from the, the question that's constantly asked to me, from my officers and from the fire department is what do you want me to do now and then when our officers are getting the brunt of the angry conversations that people you've gotten a taste of but the angry conversations and the accusations that are pushed against us each time that we're called to deal with a situation like this and we're doing it in a, in a very empathetic and trauma-informed way what is our next step and and that's the only thing that that's how I, I I would 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 if I could give any advice would be to look at what do you want us to do from the behavioral issues rather than the issues of trying to tackle homelessness, which is something 
with all due respect, you all cannot do because you don't have the resources to do it. Uh, that's just my two cents. Uh, whatever you tell me to do, I, or whatever you tell him to do, he will tell me to do. And I will. Thanks, Chief. You'll very, very one more sentence, and you need to get up to the. Okay. Um, the thing about making a, a space better is that so many people are in that one space. It's caused conflict. It does. It causes conflict. If people can kind of spread out, that's part of it too, and maybe lessen the conflicts. Okay. Because people have a space. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, are you talk, gonna talk? Yeah. Is it me or is it you? It, it's the other guy first. All right, good. No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Hey, hi. I'm Tom. I'm Tom. And could Sorry. you give us your last name for the Thomas, minute? Thomas. Thomas Fallon. Thank you. Um, this feels really weird when you're up here. I'm sorry. I've been watching for hours. My first time. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure if I was even going to comment because so many people before me, I mean, have spoken, I mean, it made me relieved to know that there's other people experiencing deeper emotions about this and it is trouble, you know? Um, but I guess what the police chief said really made me feel as if I had an interesting perspective. Um, and that, uh, carries off of what Ken said about his experience with Susan, you know, she's a great woman. Um, but sometimes the environment you're in every day don't provide opportunities to do service for others, and they don't provide feedback for what's a good behavior versus what is necessity. Um, and I think a lot of people deal with that, whether you are homeless and have a job or whatever your demographic is, you want to feel a sense of inclusion and purpose. And um, uh, the quote about this kind of tit for tat behavior of, well, we don't get a bathroom, so I'm going to piss here, you know, that happened in my building. I, I have a, an apartment right across the street from uh, Girton Park. Um, and side note, a lot of us are on VRAP. We're trying to advocate. I mean, I am. I'm trying to advocate for a uh, practical and, and kind of understanding approach that the way the economy is going, we don't know what's going to happen to people that are already in, in, you know, installed in their homes and where they might have to go. So I think uh, a really um, just kind hearted way to deal with it is to address the public on mass. I mean, we have newspapers and we have ways to release statements. And um, I'm so sorry that you experienced the hatred and stuff. Uh, the pushback, but it, it but it is a dire issue, and um, the fact that the shelters are closing, um, the people, I mean, they're going to sleep on the park benches whether you want it or not. You know, I think your option is how are we going to do that to make it look nice in our community and to make it something that we can deal with or um, we can you know bear. It's a shameful thing, um, but we all, are, you know, we 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 just live our lives. And so you can't really force a homeless person to go and seek that uh, elsewhere. But I do think we can take the cue from other cities. Uh, maybe, you know, look at Portland. They have a really crazy homeless problem. But, you know, just small things. We obviously are full of uh, people with, with plenty of skills and ideas. And I've talked to people individually. And, uh, yeah, their communication is off. So I think releasing statements about what you're going to do and what you want to put forward is great. Um, you know, I, I, so I'm optimistic. And, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Circle back. Just just try to try to. Um, oh, gosh, am I giving advice here? No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I have to do with it. No, he said, he said, or she said, she said, where do they go if they, if they have nowhere to go and, and they don't like the people there? Well, that's kind of me sometimes because I have to put up with these people, but, you know, they're hard to deal with. And so uh, if we're all going through psychological stuff and we're all pointing the finger, it's not going to work. Um, provide the resources. I love that. I, I just, I, I love the conversation of what, what's the kind of gift we can give to these people, you know, in a way that works for the community. I think the community wants that. And that's all I really have to say. All right, thanks for coming. Uh, Nat. Um, I think there's some, uh, there's some really good things happening and I'd like to hit on those. Uh, 
you were kind enough and you were kind enough to uh, invite me to that meeting at the rabble riser and um, people are talking to each other people who are vulnerable are talking to each other and this is this is uh, this is a great thing it's an advantage that we have at the moment people are talking to each other so i don't think we should uh i think we should seize on we may not be able to do a lot of things right away but i think we should seize on the good fortune that people are talking to each other that's number one number two i think we should begin to make discernible steps towards some of the more difficult arrangements that we need to put in place. Uh, we may not be able to build a, a patio apartments uh, with loges and great views for people right away. But we probably can find a way for people to have a place uh, to relieve themselves, go to the bathroom, to take a shower. We can do some simple things right away. We can continue to talk. We can do some simple things right away. And we can draw in those people whom we've discovered to help us design a plan that incrementally will address their needs and our needs. So I congratulate you and you and others because I think things are beginning to happen. I wasn't actually going to speak, but you looked past me. <laughs> and I thought it was I who was being called upon to speak. So, OK, um, thank, all right. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are a couple of people of the public who want to, who have already spoken. I will let uh, call on Morgan and Dawn one minute, and I'll be very strict with that. So me? Yes. Morgan Brown again. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, one of the things I had, mentioned, had meant to mention is previously, before the pandemic, people could gather at uh, the community meals sites, and that was good. And that hasn't been available as much. And another matter is uh, a lot of times people don't have activities and things to do, and if they did, um, that would uh, be helpful. And lastly, I just want to say in terms of resources, I would argue that our community has more resources than it's willing to admit. We just don't always do a good job of sharing them and make them make them available to those who have nothing, who have little. And we need to do better in that regard. Thank you very much for your time and listening. Thanks, Morgan. Don, you too, one minute, if you have a, a minute. Yep, um, two things. One, um, if Richard Shear, Stephen Whitaker, Ward Joyce, and I can agree on something, I think it's worth consideration. Um, however, briefly, and I know there are some obstacles, but a number of the people outside have all been talking about how great it would be if that was just at the back of that lot. And I know Cameron has said there are a number of obstacles. I also would like to point out that if you have it further away from the street, it might reduce some of the less necessary calls for emergency services. Um, my other point is if you're talking about moving it down Stonecutter's Way or something, please be mindful that it may not be best to put it in a residential section. That's all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don. 30 seconds. Yep. Uh, Oh, it slipped my mind. That's okay. Not, that late. It's good. Uh, <laughs> we we have a lot to talk about. Um, so, where where are we now, folks? I I clearly don't see that there are votes to say we're getting this, uh, moving it from where it is. Um, all right. So I just want to say that um, after sitting for five hours, I cannot make great decisions. And that's probably true for a lot of other people. So 
not to say that we can't make any decision. I just kind of feel like it needs to be said. Um, I, I do not know what to do here. I feel like we have a, a really significant problem facing us that needs to be addressed and we are not finding ways to address it. Uh, and I appreciate the chief of police asking for some direction on how to handle the, the additional load on the public safety folks. Um, we have uh, a lot of folks who feel ex who are who are feeling very unwelcomed by um, from lots of different directions, I think, by what's happening there. And um, I don't know where the solutions to that are supposed to come from, but I don't see one sitting here right in front of us right now. Um, leaving things the way they are does not seem like a good idea. So if there's a, a way to rearrange things in that space, I'm unclear whether that's actually a possibility given the space. I would like to hear more about that. Um, moving it somewhere completely different and way out of town means it's not gonna serve the need that it's serving now. And it also would mean that it would be reducing the problems that are occurring now, um, presumably, or though maybe not. I don't know. Uh, so, um, so I guess I'm 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 not convinced that just doing nothing is a good idea. And if we could hear more about maybe there's some way to change the use of that space. And um, as a new council member, I'm also not entirely sure what response we can give to your to the chief of police's question about how do we handle these calls. Um, kind of seems like you should handle them the way you handle them elsewhere, but I don't know, you know, if, if you need some kind of different direction from us. So I, I'm rambling a little bit here. Um, as I say, it's, Thanks, it's almost tomorrow, so I'll stop. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to... Uh... <laughs> We've passed our second break time, folks. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to make an observation, which is that I think that uh, I, I agree with you, Carrie, that I don't think doing nothing is... Uh, is a good option. I don't know what the next step is. I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with Ken Russell about whether it would be a sensible thing to move it in the uh, in back of uh, another way. And I still think that that's something that is was worth considering. And in terms of one of the things that I've heard from a lot of people and observed uh, at the public hearing the other night, which is that the one function that this structure serves is it's a structure where people can go and congregate and get services and uh, and service providers know where to find people same thing would be true with uh, having something a short walk uh, from downtown at, at another way and so i or even in downtown at, at another way and so I'm not saying we have to make the decision to do that tonight, but I do think that, uh, you know, Ken, Ken, you're nodding. It seems, seems like something um, you're open to. I haven't talked to my board about this, um, but we were looking like a year and a half ago, we were looking at bringing in a shed to do pretty much the same function. I, I know I approached Bill at one point about this idea and there were some concerns. My only suggestion was going to be given the hour and the brains that while I tend to agree that we need to do something. We've heard a lot of feedback and got some sense of what may or may not be feasible, and we may need to do something, but we don't necessarily need to do something, you know, until two more weeks yep. um, or whatever, because we also have a long agenda. So, you know, I mean, I, rather than try to force ourselves into a bad decision or, or something, you know, let's let's yeah. talk yeah. to them. Let's see what happens. You know, let's look at the back of the lot. Let's see, you know, come back with some more thoughtful commentary. Lauren. I mean, I, I th agree we should wait for um, any action because it's really late. <laughs> but um, one question I had, though, was, you know, so you referenced earlier that the Homelessness Task Force is working on kind of scope for the RFP. And I mean, this conversation always becomes bigger than just this this one structure. Right. And so I'm just wondering if like, when we're expecting that, because I think the broader contextual conversation around like, what are the other steps and what are the other things the city's doing and what are the pieces and, you know, are we getting the right 
questions to the consultant that are answering some of these pieces. Um, and so, like, to me, that would be a more productive conversation that could help inform this particular right. question. I mean, I just real quick, because it's late for me to um, is, I mean, Cameron was at the meeting and we were all talking about the need to sort of into like, we can't just hand this work off to Cameron to hand off to the consultant to, to issue an RFP to issue the consultant. We, we need to actively, there's a lot of wisdom, collective wisdom in what we're doing. But there, you know, there, there are a lot of moving parts. There's p potential moving parts. Um, it is integrated, but the, it's, we're also just got done with a preliminary study of, you know, root causes and people's stories of how they ended up there that Will Eberly championed um, through the continuum of care. Um, so we're moving on it, um, but it, you know it's it, you know it's only so many months until cold weather again. So good points. We got we got to get we got to get cracking. Sounds good. I'm going to cut this off now because, believe it or not, folks, we have more stuff that we have to do tonight. <laughs> so uh, and. You you all can leave, um, but those of us those of us on the council cannot. And go to the bathroom. I think it's inhuman for us to be here nearly three hours. Thanks. <laughs> You're not yeah, thanks for your support. Thanks for your support. Thank you guys. Over Center is Sorry, what? Oh, jeez. Go. Um, an item that we need to take care of tonight is uh, is the next item on our, on our agenda, item 2022-112. It's the Northern Border Regional Commission grant options. Um, Bill, are you kicking this one off? Sure. Um, so we have not applied to this funding source before, um, and we understand that you know like many places they have a lot more money this year than normal and may not have it again uh, and it came it was interesting because i had been speaking to the mayor and i think the energy that MIAC had a cut that you know i think the district heat idea and the idea to perhaps have a heat pump program those were, were you know sort of the the mayor's ideas and MIAC's ideas and I was kind of looking into that funding and then we had a you know, recent staff meeting and other folks was like, hey, we were thinking of this for, for hours. So I went back to the mayor and said, you know, I, I, I could just tell them that they can't apply because the mayor wants this. And she said, no, 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 that wouldn't work, you know, that we need to bring it to the full council. So we have, uh, you know, a list of items. 
on here. We we have looked in, in a. Excuse uh, me, Bill. Can I interrupt you for just a minute? Is someone in the room available to go outside and tell the people in the hall to be quiet? Yeah, there we go. Thanks, Chief. Wow. <laughs> we sent the we sent the the militia out. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, um, so we did ask our team to to submit ideas that they had, and I think that you know they're all great ideas. Uh, just in the order we have them listed here, one is uh, to seek funding for the Elks Club uh, planning process. Um, that would be you know perhaps in lieu of any other funding plan we might come you know we wouldn't this wouldn't be our funding plan, but obviously if we could get that that'd be great. Confluence Park, of course, we, we just passed some bonds and there's funds, but uh, there's also a, a CSO limit uh, uh, outfall right near there. So perhaps it could look at uh, eliminating that so that if people were in the water there, it would be less toxic. Uh, District Heat, um, we, are, we need more connections. And one thought is as we're constructing East State Street, we could extend the line. So, the, so there's, this would actually maybe re require two um, funding. There's also a capital improvements for private or nonprofit groups. Uh, so one thought is we could seek funds here to extend the line and then seek that as a package, seek that fund for the private people to then pay for their connections because those are also quite expensive. So it'd be kind of a twofer. Uh, and, and then I think the mayor had an idea to maybe either create a, a just a grant or a revolving loan fund to help low-income people put energy efficiency like heat pumps into their homes to you know overcome that barrier of entry the cemetery is a major uh, chapel and vault building that they've been talking about for years uh, that needs serious repairs um, and we have thought about you know they technically are a separate chartered entity um, so we're exploring you know potentially they could apply as the green mount cemetery and then we could pick project we apply for so that's one option and then um, we, we you have in your goals of work you know some ways to try to create some sort of workforce development perhaps for needy people or others youth um, and to may, perhaps look at the feast program as a way to create jobs and those kinds of things for people um, so that was submitted by the senior center so that was our list they're all it's, it's tough to prioritize they're all pretty worthy um, so I think this is these are policy and priority matters, and they kind of fall here. They're, all, they're all they're all really well. They're all really in our strategic plan. So I'm going to jump in from my, myself first this time. Uh, I I like the idea of asking the cemetery commission to uh, submit their own proposal. I I talked to the mayor this afternoon, and she had just heard of a. Of, of a program called v light v l i t e which is i think done by uh, veic or efficiency vermont which is uh, a grant uh, opportunity for to help low-income people with energy efficiency pro uh, projects and so just thinking about ways we could knock out some of these and proceed with others so i would knock out uh, number four and five for that reason, um, and uh, and with workforce support too, I think you know I, I don't know what they're looking for. We're not we're not going to get we're not going to submit something for four projects and get funded for four projects. No. So uh, I would uh, probably do this in the order that it's listed and do, go for one, two, and three. I don't know. Yeah, Lauren. I think actually we should be down to um, one, maybe two at the most. Um, I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. we're not asking to apply for all of them. I think part of the problem is we had competing interests, including amongst our own team, and they all seem to fall into our priorities. And this felt, you know, normally we'd come in and say, here's how we rank them. And um, but I think in this case, we need just need some guidance from you. And I know I realize it's not easy because if I had to do it, it would be hard. And but I, I will. Lauren, 
one question before do we have any sense have, has anyone talked to them or grant recipients of like what kinds of projects they tend to like and tend to fund i mean i so i haven't talked to them i have talked with the person at the state who works with them uh, and is a montpelier resident and so i, I you know it, it's kind of wide open but they they are more i i tend to agree that the workforce support is more of a program and less of a project and it's more of a project thing so uh, beyond that, I think there, are, you know, there's a wide range of things. Okay. Um, well, given given that, I I agree with Jack's initial hacking away, um, encouraging the cemetery um, commission to apply. In addition, as a separate application, um, I mean, I think I would order it personally. District heat. That's just a hard one to find funding for and just a case of like a unique need um, confluence park we've had good luck with other funding sources and there's momentum there and it just feels like it's going in a way that district heat this could be a jump start in a way that it doesn't have right now um elks club you know i mean maybe when you do the analysis you'll be like we really need this <laughs> this, this grant but um I, I think there's also it seems like we can probably find the money to do the stuff that's kind of the short term planning, maybe more easily than funding for district heat. So I would probably do district heat Elks Club Confluence Park. Yeah, that's, fine. that's okay. That's what you think. Yeah, I was, that's how I numbered them too. But I just have to put a plug in for the cemetery, because we no longer have continued visiting them. But that is an awesome chapel, neglected, and I would hope staff would give them help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Terry. Um, yeah, I uh, I heard from from somebody in District Three about the cemetery and got a chance to see a picture of inside that chapel, which I had never seen. I didn't even know it existed. So, um, if they can apply separately, that would be great. I'd be all for that. Um, I, in general, I'm always going to lean towards what's going to really help people directly and the greatest number of people. So I was really drawn to the um, the heat pump distribution one. So if if that's a real funding possibility from somewhere else, and if there is a if we think that the city may pursue that, great. Then let's take that off the list. But I really like to see that happen. I, that one I, I really like that resonated with me. And so then after that, what I'm looking at is how many people are going to be served here and how many um, and how direct is that? And so maybe that's district heat if it can be, you know, actual residents of Montpelier who are hooked up who wouldn't otherwise be. I would actually put the Elks Club way down on the list because I think we're going to figure out a way to do that one way or another. And um, and again, I'd like to see something that's really going to be like kind of going into the the pocket, so to speak, of, of people in Montpelier. Um, so I think I'd put district heat at the top. And then um, I don't know about Confluence Park, um, if we're getting if we have funding elsewhere, maybe I'm just going to stop right there and say <laughs> district heat. Bill, following up on the district heat thing, there is it right that there's capacity for more connections and what what would those entities be that would be we would be adding if uh, well so that's we you know that's the challenge and it depends on the funding that we have so you know right at the corner of east state there might be some but then it's really is all residential up until you know the big building where uh vita is uh, and that would probably i don't think we'd be get anywhere near enough money to take it all the way up to the college or something like that so that would be as far as we'd go so that it's countermanded by the fact that there aren't any large users but um, nonetheless if we could get a, a series of users uh, you know funded elsewhere um, that would be more revenue to the system at really not much operating cost difference so um, but you know it would have to be Actually, this is the one that it started. It started with us looking at this for district heat, and that's where MIAC was. And then the 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 heat pump idea kind of got added to that, and then staff came in with the other ideas. Um, but the district heat one, does, you know, we do it really works best if we can also get this other funding. And one idea was maybe to see if Montpelier Alive could be the nonprofit funding source instead of trying to get each entity to get their own grant 
um, along the line so that we got the money and then could dole it out to the people making the connections. Um, and that way, if there were additional connections along the current route, we could also do that. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, at this point, these are just letters of intent that we're sending in. It's kind of getting us, you know, time. So, you know, we could potentially send two letters of intent in and really only apply for one, but I think any more than that would be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And Linda Berger online, uh, you're, uh, here, you're on the Cemetery Commission, I believe, so why don't we hear from you? And um, we just wanted to say that uh, we would just we will would probably submit a separate request for this project. We worked with Cameron um, on the other grant that was submitted in April of 2021. Um, she was very helpful, and so we've we're documented for the need for um, repairs on the chapel vault. So we would just wonder if the city council would give a letter of support for our separate project request. Okay, thanks. Donna. Well, the other thing for District 8, I see one of the biggest need is to reduce the cost. The cost really got high this last year. We got a lot of complaints. So that is something I'm not sure the whole council is aware of. Well, yes and no. Their bills. So some people's bills so yeah. we, we sort of did a well it, it's probably another whole i think we were planning to do a district heat update in a couple of meetings so it'd probably be best to get into that in detail there so um but certainly regard regardless of that issue um having more revenue into the system uh without incurring a lot of capital costs is really what's needed and um just you know i think it's worth pursuing but so so we're all the others. So. <laughs> and there's no question that Cemetery Vault is a you know major project and it's been on hold for ten years at least. Yeah. You send them a letter of support. Yeah. Yes. Everybody agree we should send a letter of support to the cemetery. Okay. Yes. Okay, Linda, you got your letters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. You're welcome. And we're all over the map on what uh, we could possibly be doing. Yeah. I am in the camp of Donna and this lady over here. That one, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Which, which that's, and what camp? That's all. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> what, are, what are you? Um, district heat at the top. That's and you too. I, the rest, I'm really okay with, but I feel like district uh, heat should be. How many people would vote district heat number one? All right, that's that's number that's number one. Um, yes. We don't need one, but it's up to you. What I think about Confluence Park is that I agree that you know there's some momentum, but. Uh, but the CSO thing, mm -hmm. you know, we've got this long list of CSO projects that we need to do, and it's going to take years to address them all. And so even if we could just get one more knocked off, that would be a, a, a real benefit to the city. And it's, I wouldn't, I don't think I would package it as a a uh, confluence park project. I think I would package it as a CSO, CSO project. Yeah, a water water quality, uh, keeping stuff out of uh, the route to Lake Champlain. Yeah, Just, I think that's a great idea. I think you know if we get, especially if we get advice from them that there's no harm in putting in two proposals, then we should totally do that. Um, my, I guess one question that you might have for them on that one, if you're able to connect with someone before, um, I know it's a quick deadline, so if not, it's okay, but like there is a lot of federal dollars right now for CSO um, issues. The state is, the, the budget that passed the House had something like $25 million in new money for CSO um, issues and stuff, so I don't know if knowing that there's federal infrastructure dollars and stuff that are going to that, if that would be like lower on their priority list, because it's something that there's other kind of programs that are funding right now. 
it doesn't mean that we would get that money or anything necessarily. So I, I think it's still a good project to seek, but just um, I guess if it's one of two anyway, then there's low risk, but just just noting if I don't know how they're doing their calculus. Yeah. That. What is there, anyone else think? It's still okay to put the CSO project in as a as the second one? Or is there a, I mean, another again, a letter one of intent? We can always file that and then withdraw that one. Mm -hmm. We could find out that we were getting more money from the state or something. Right. Yeah. I had the Elks and I would stay with the Elks Club for my second. Okay, yeah, I put the Elks first, but I would, I think I'm persuaded to, uh, to put it lower. They, is this something they do every year? They do, but not with this level of funding. This yeah. is kind of what's unique about it. So it's sort of like everyone's going for it. Um, the only thing I'll say, and I, I, first of all, I think I agree with your choices, um, but I will say this about the Elks is, I mean, we will have to take money from other places. So, you know, Mike mentioned the 50,000 for economic development, which is fine, except some of that was going to go to an economic development strategic plan. So that would mean we weren't doing that. Uh -huh. And, you know, we might look at ARPA, which is fine, but really the bulk of what's unclaimed for that is the 425,000 for housing, which this would be to help generate housing. So there, there will be some trade-offs when we think about where we get the, that money from. So we, we can come up with it, but it, you know, it's, it's one thing versus another, unless the hub gives us you know, half a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Walk out of the room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we're actually also submitting, the hub is submitting a letter of intent, and it occurred to me that perhaps we could do something joint for the whole property as a, as a joint application. Right. So our application, it would be to, to fund the planning process. The yeah, and so maybe we could figure out a way to join that up with what we might want to do. We only have three days to do it. Right. But right. All of those, I mean, we've, we've looked at very carefully at what they, they do fund. Uh, they funded a community center in Plainfield for $220,000 last mm -hmm. year, for example. Uh, they're encouraging uh, infrastructure, uh, job creation, and all of those are the kinds of things that we were talking about wanting to apply for. But we can talk about that. Sure. Later. Are we happy with where we are on this? But I'm not sure where we are. <laughs> that was my question. So what does Bill feel his directive is? My directive absolutely is to send a letter of intent about District Heat. <laughs> yep. And that, you're not sending one about the Elks Club? I, oh, well, the, the, what I'd heard was the second choice of at least some people was the CSO dam removal and Ooh. others for the Elks Club. So I don't have clear direction if there's four of you for so maybe second. we need to do a little Let's, vote on yeah, that. Yeah. We'll do a little formal. Okay. Um. What, I, what I was suggesting was that as, as you're transferring one of your requests to the uh, Green Cemetery. Mountain Cemetery, you could, we could, because for us, having this planning process go faster by getting a grant mm -hmm. is definitely in our interest. And we could apply, but include that portion of it in, in our application. That's just. Yep, I appreciate that. What do you think of that, Donna? Does that cover it? I, you know, I guess, I, I, so I would say the question, just since we're here and you brought it up, would be what else are you asking for? Because I, I think for us to be partners in an application that is for a specific construction, when we haven't really made a conclusion about the timing, I, I would think that that would be what the councils want to know. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what else is in the application. I think if we're jointly applying for a planning process to see, then you know maybe. But um, it is it is the city owned property. It seems kind of odd for us to have someone else apply for that, honestly. But we can talk if that's where. Okay. If that is if if that becomes their number two priority, then we can talk about whether that's feasible. That's what I'd say. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. So <laughs> Elks Club, we're, we're already doing uh, District Heat. How many people are, uh, we should also do Elks Club. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll go with that too. So I only get one vote. Yeah, so Elks Club it is. For, it's oh, four. Right. Yeah, I said yes. Yeah. You didn't vote for CSO, damn. She so thinks there's more money. Yeah. So much money right now. Sorry, Carter. She's going to help us get it. <laughs> I will happily do everything I can to try to help the city get. Okay, I think that resolves that that, okay. that item. Um, other business? I don't think we have other business. Um, council reports. Start on your end tonight. Really quick, um, we had a social and economic justice advisory committee meeting with the different um, committee chairs, um, giving them an update on the new stipend pilot program that we're rolling out. Um, and so it was sparsely attended, I would say. So um, it would be great to, well, when, when it's not so late, um, I'd love to get information to all of you so that we can be disseminating as another helpful outlet um, in addition to Cameron and city staff and getting this in front of people because we want to make sure people know that this program is going to start July 1st and how it's going to work and there's still opportunity for feedback and stuff. Thanks. I'm healthy and I have nothing else to say. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, I'll go next. Um, People uh, have uh, have been learning recently, and there's been a lot of some publicity. Long time time uh, peace activist uh, Lucy Nickel uh, recently died. Um, she did a whole variety of uh, peace activities, including one of the people who was out in front of, has been out in front of the uh, post office. Uh, every week for many many years uh, my personal connection with lucy goes back to uh, even before bill came to uh, the city of montpelier which is really something um, dinosaur here. yeah it was back uh, back in 1989 and 1990 there were uh, groups all around the country looking at the world situation and saying hey we don't have the Soviet Union anymore. We should uh, start cutting our military budget and telling the government to take some of that money that we're cutting from the military and spending it on human needs. And a number of uh, activists here in Montpelier circulated a petition to put a resolution on the uh, town meeting day but ballot uh, in 1990 to say just that, to say we the people of Montpelier think that we should be cutting the uh, military budget and spending it on human needs. And they got the requisite number of signatures. They came to the city council and said, we've got the requisite number of signatures. We want you to put this on the ballot. And the, uh, and the city council said, no, we're not doing that <laughs> because that's not city business. And so, um, so some of these peace activists came to me because they knew me, and the and and the plaintiffs were Chris Wood, Ron Ferry, and Lucy Nickel, and uh, and I represented them and sued the uh, city of Montpelier and the <laughs> and the members of the city council uh, to they get <laughs> to get an injunction to. Uh, to force the city to put this, uh, put it on the ballot. And we won and we got the injunction from uh, the Washington uh, Superior Court and got it put on the ballot. The well, there's there's case law and everything, but we got, uh, <laughs> but we got it. And of course it passed uh, very, uh, very well. The peace well, dividend it was called. <laughs> the peace dividend, it's exactly right. So, and so that was, uh, so that was Lucy Nickel, and uh, yes, and uh, and so I think people will, many people in Montpelier are uh, going to be remembering Lucy, and that's all I've got. That's sweet, Connor. She had a few pages of a book I'd like to read. Just to <laughs> <laughs> is it is it the Great Gatsby? <laughs> really sums up. Uh, no, I'm all set. <laughs> 
Oh, I just have one thing. Um, got an email recently, maybe everybody here got it, about an opportunity to get free trees to plant in your yard. And uh, on St. Paul Street several years ago, we had one of our neighbors did a really coordinated um, effort with the tree board, got a whole lot of flowering fruit and nut trees planted on our street. It's really fantastic. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity for more trees, and I really hope that people snap these up and plant them all over their yards. Cool. Is my cool. son going to plant it in your yard? I, I don't This one might be self-planting, oh, okay. actually, so I'll have to learn some planting native skills. Species native species. Yeah. Donna. Is that all you want to say? Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to close the meeting with, I really do feel we have to contain public comment that speaking is not the only avenue and that we have less time to talk when this meeting is only the time we can talk to one another about issues. And I feel it needs to be balanced and I may come across as whatever, but I do think it has to be balanced and contained and keep people on topic because I don't think this is acceptable. I, I, I totally get that. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I would say that though that uh, much of the commentary today I thought was really pretty focused to not only focused but also informed and so I thought it was but just every time we valuable. talk about it we get this huge instead of the small piece of blockers we'll go through this whole thing again yeah mm -hmm. that's all and Robert's good, rules of order is really good clear point. you get one chance around folks that's it not yep. two not three once yeah. good point <laughs> um okay. what are we up to Sorry. next Sorry. Uh, Clerk first. I'm so tired. I'm not sure I know who any of you people are. <laughs> okay. That's all I got. Um, manager. Um, yeah, that's right. I've tried to get this done before tomorrow. Um, so you mentioned Lucy Nichol. I'd just like to mention I attended the services for Steve Walk on Saturday morning. And uh, just a thank you to he and his family. Steve was on the city, the very first city council I worked for here. Montpelier served from 1995 to 1999 and then actually came back on after Tom Carey passed away to fill out half a term and was just an active person, very active person in our community. We missed, uh, people know him as Steamer, uh, larger, larger than life person and personality. So, uh, yeah. Yep, my wife uh, served on the uh, family center board with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, very active, very good, good man. So he'll be missed. And anything else I have to say, I can put in the weekly memo. Uh, <laughs> okay. Without objection, we are adjourned at 11.58 p.m. So we're out of here before midnight. <laughs>